is really bad. The hearing is coming to order. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for coming to today's joint hearing of the Committee on Public Housing and the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I am Council Member Alika Samuel, and I chair the Public Housing Committee, and I am joined by the Labor Chair, Council Member Danique Miller. Although we are here today to discuss employment opportunities for residents through various regulations and legal agreements, I want to just remind everyone who we are talking about. We are talking about residents of public housing, some of whom were without heat yesterday as temperatures dropped down to single digits. And today when I woke up, it was 14 degrees and I already had several messages in my inbox of residents freezing in their apartments throughout the night and also recognizing that we are in the middle of a government shutdown. I have also been contacted by residents who work for the United States government, and they have no idea how they will be able to make it through the rest of the month without a paycheck. We as a city, a state, and a nation have a lot of work to do and a lot of problems to solve. So this committee is fully committed to advocating on behalf of the residents and utilizing our platforms, positions, and oversight hearings to do just that. So as I stated, the focus of today's oversight hearing is NYCHA's compliance with Section 3 of the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968. We will also discuss the project labor agreements between NYCHA and contractors. Section 3 is a federal housing law which prescribes that employment and other economic opportunities generated by HUD financial assistance is directed towards low and very low income persons to the greatest extent feasible. Public housing residents are prioritized among those persons. Nearly half of NYCHA families are working. And while it is true that many NYCHA families are supported by social security, pensions, and other government programs, it is also true that there are residents who are looking for work, residents who are eager to be connected to opportunities so that they can better support themselves and their families. NYCHA is in a unique position to make that connection. By complying with Section 3, NYCHA can encourage resident employment, foster skills that could help residents find long-term job placements, and ultimately reduce poverty and wealth inequality throughout our city. Yesterday I received notice as the country and the world honored the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 90th birthday that Mayor de Blasio announced his administration placed 15,000 NYCHA residents into jobs since 2014 through workforce programs. 15,000 is a great number. And I look forward to hearing all about where those 15,000 residents were placed, how much they are earning, how long did they remain in their jobs, and what NYCHA and this administration is doing to continue adding to that number in the months and years to come. Particularly, as NYCHA pursues large-scale construction projects with its new development plan, NYCHA 2.0, which will likely require an expanded workforce there may be avenues to strategically increase resident employment. We have renovations happening through the RAD and PAC conversions, new construction via the 50-50, the old 50-50, or the 70-30 projects at Holmes Tower and Wyckoff Gardens. The council is still pushing for the $500 million that was allocated in last year's budget for new construction of senior housing, amongst other deals. We see development happening around us every single day. We are constantly asked by residents how they can get on a job on this particular site or that particular site. But there always seems to be some type of a hurdle or mountain to climb. Again, fulfilling Section 3 requirements is not just the right thing to do, but required by law. As part of the lawsuit within the federal government, NYCHA has admitted that it was not in compliance with Section 3. The committees today and members of the public here today must hear from NYCHA what steps it has taken to ensure compliance going forward. And today I want to hear what path NYCHA is choosing. NYCHA has the opportunity to prioritize its residents, 
That means including resident employment in its strategic plans for the future, strengthening partnerships with labor unions, and monitoring the implementation of Section 3 to ensure that working residents are being treated fairly. I look forward to hearing from NYCHA today about how it plans to do just that. And at this time, we will now hear from my co-chair, Council Member Danique Miller. Thank you, Chair Samuels. Once again, I'm Council Member I. Danique Miller, the Chair of the Committee of Civil Service and Labor. I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Alika Samuels, the Chair of the Committee on Public Housing, for holding this hearing and on this very, very important topic. Today's hearing, we will look to learn about NYCHA's compliance with Section 3 hiring requirements of Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968. In particular, I'm interested in the labor issues, but more importantly, the labor opportunities that are afforded as a result of NYCHA's compliance with Section 3. I look forward to learning from NYCHA, the various labor unions, and, and NYCHA and various labor unions presented today, and all others that will be testifying. As my colleague discussed, NYCHA is, is, is complex authority. This agency was created in 1934 as to provide low cost housing for middle class, working families, temporary unemployed due to the Great Depression, to bolster the lagging economy created by the lack of job trades. At the time this agency's purpose and function began to now, they have drastically changed. Now one would say that NYCHA has become primarily a place where the city's lowest income families and individuals can have a decent affordable housing. However, there is reason to believe that this goal may not be uh, provided at this time. This is an uh, issue itself, but generally NYCHA is an affordable option for many low income New Yorkers who simply cannot afford the staggering rents within our city. In addition to providing housing for its 390 authorized residents, there is and has always been a substantial opportunity to promote and increase employment and training among NYCHA residents, which could effectively reduce overall poverty and wealth inequality throughout our city. In efforts to ensure the lowest income per persons in society generally living in public housing are provided these opportunities, training and contracting were generated by federal financial assistance from HUD Section 3 of HUD Act of 1968 was created. Section 3, which applied to NYCHA properties, requires that recipients of HUD funding, including developers, owners, contractors, and subcontractors, ensure 30 percent of their new hires be set aside for low-income individuals. Also, Section 3 created Section 3 business concerns of which are owned by Section 3 residents and required to be awarded a set percentage of construction and non-construction contracts. Finally, specific to New York City and to strengthen New York City's Section 3 hiring requirements, NYCHA created Resident Assistant Program in 2001, which we required that for capital and modernization contracts valued over $500,000, those contractors bidding spend 15% of total project labor costs on residents who live in public housing. To ensure these requirements are met and that qualified candidates are trained and placed in correct employment and training opportunities, workforce, career centers, and NYCHA offices, residents' economic empowerment and sustainability are used. Reese. These both serve as integral to the mission of Section 3 and maintain NYCHA's compliance with their hiring requirements. However, we have seen non-compliance with these requirements. This was made perfectly clear in June 2018 when NYCHA admitted that they were not in compliance with Section 3 hiring requirements. In addition, New York City's controller audit showed that there was substantial compliance non-compliance and monitoring issues with NYCHA contracts. Finally, in August of 2018, kickback schemes were discovered and arrests were made. Increasingly, these investigations are still going on. We would like to hear how exactly these incidents 
and incidents such as these ha have occurred and how, we are, how they are being currently addressed. Time and time again, the most valued New Yorkers, residents have been failed by New York City government. I hope that this hearing will be informative and that we learn more about NYCHA and their compliance with Section 3 and we do not hear the same promises of one-off jobs for NYCHA residents like a roof that is being replaced or a one-time painting job or other such jobs. We want to ensure that NYCHA residents have opportunities to real career opportunities. So, I want to, we want to ensure that the residents can begin their careers that they so desperately need. I want to say that we've been joined by uh, members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, Councilmember Drum, King, Adams, Aldrich, and Mizell. I also like to thank my staff, Brandon Clark, Joe Goldblum, and committee's counsel and staff, Malcolm, Kendall, and Kevin as well. And certainly, uh, I'd like to thank my co-sponsor for today for convening this important topic and hearing, and I now turn it over to my colleague, Councilmember Sanders. Thank you. We've also been joined by Councilmember Salamanca and Councilmember Ruit, um, Ruben Diaz Sr. So um, we will first hear from a resident panel before the agency. Mr. Willie Lewis from St. Nicholas Houses. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Miss, Miss, Mrs. Willie Lewis from St. Nicholas Houses, please come to the front. Jenny Moore, 410 Beach, 54th Street. Richard Stevens, 182 South Street. Were you going to testify as a resident or no? As a resident. Okay. Mm -hmm. So before we hear from the NYCHA as an agency and the administration, we like to hear from the residents so that we can get a, um, a sense of what's actually happening on the ground. And the reason why we're here is because you are here. And so we want to make sure that we amplify your voice and that the agency um, speaks directly to what it is that you're saying. So um, that's the reason why we're calling the residents up first. And with that being said, we will start with Mrs. Willie Lewis. Good afternoon. Oh, I thought my voice, okay. From St. Nicholas Houses, I thought my president was going to be here, Mr. Tyrone Ball, but I see that he hasn't arrived yet. However, I'm here uh, because we have a contract. We are under the MAP program. We have a contract. Uh, um, with the roofing now. A lot of young people have expressed to me, although I'm not the president, I'm a former president of the St. Nicholas Houses and also a former NYCHA uh, person uh, that was on NYCHA's board. Uh, but what's happening, these young people are not being hired by the contractors. With this roofing going on, um, I, people have young people come to me and they ask me about jobs and stuff. I send them to the president and nothing happens, okay? Then they come back and tell me they told me supposed to go this place, they supposed to go that place, and they go and then they wait for a call and no call. Uh, the thing is, also with the contractors, uh, they seem to be bringing in people from other places, which I think is really unfair to the residents. Because when you have a contract uh, uh, at your development, the first thing that the young people want to do, a lot of them, is get a job. They go over to management, they go to see the president, and nothing happens, okay? Uh, right now, we are uh, in the process of the uh, roof uh, thing uh, being contract. 
However, there's asbestos uh, on each of the roofs. We have 14 uh, buildings in our development, and um, the asbestos removal, nobody knows what's going on. This past Friday, something fell from the roof, and you should have seen the smoke or the ashes or whatever it was. And I went downstairs because it was my building that I live in that this happened. And they, I don't think they were very truthful uh, as to what fell off the roof. I'm just glad it wasn't a person that fell off the roof. But the thing is, with asbestos, is it goes up in the air. All of you know something about asbestos. It's poison. You can breathe it. Uh, you can get lung cancer. And I don't think that the contractor is handling the contract the way it should be at St. Nicholas Houses. Uh, we need someone to come up there and investigate. Also, now, on my building, out of all of the buildings, they said they had six. I suggested at two meetings, which we never got anything except that they were testing. We never got another update as to what was happening with the water, with the legionaries. We had two or three people that got sick from it and had to be hospitalized. Um, you know, just because we are low income, we are human. We do pay rent, you know, some of us still pay taxes. And I think that we are just, just, just look like that we are not inhuman, just like the woman just said about the heating thing. There are uh, uh, apartments, buildings, where I'm getting pretty good heat, but I uh, had a lady to, uh, when I was coming from church Sunday morning to stop and hold the door to tell me that the only heat that she's getting is in the kitchen and in the bathroom. No heat in the, ba in the bedrooms. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on. I know this is about Section 3, and I'm st I want to get back on to that. And I think there should be an investigation and the contractors need to come to the tenants meeting to let them know what is going on up the, on that roof and not send a helper who is carrying pipes up on the roof. OK, that to me is very insulting, you know, and, and uh, I think we deserve answers as to what's going on in St. Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, Mrs. Uh, Willie Lewis. I just want to um, recognize that we've been joined by Council Member Joe Nye, and I also recognize that we have uh, Ms. Torres in the audience, and I wanted to know if you wanted to come up and testify. You can. There's a seat right next to the gentleman. Thank you. And before you go, I need everyone to just state your name for the record before your testimony. Oh, so, Mrs. Sorry. Willie Lewis, I know I, I said your name, but can you just state your name for the record? Oh, my name is Willie Mae Lewis, and I'm from St. Nicholas Houses. Okay, thank you. Thanks. My name is Jerry Moore. I'm from Ocean Bay Houses in Fort Rockaway. Oh. Yeah, I'm here, to rep I'm here representing um, Ocean Bay Houses. Me and like two of my other co-workers came through and they wanted us to speak about the development and stuff that's going on there. Well, uh, I'm born and raised there. I've been there since since a kid, since a little kid. And um, and I've seen a lot of changes, you know, from, from old to new. And um, it's, it's got better. It's got better, you know, with the, with the new, with the, uh, with the construction and the building the fixing of the apartments and everything but it's the job wise like you got a lot of guys you know young guys that's out of work that's looking for work and um you know they come to me you know I don't hire but I can direct them you know recommend them you know what they have to do to put in a resume and just you know follow up on your resume you know because a lot of people you know when they put in resumes they think once they put in a resume, they don't have to. Sometimes you have to go check on your resume just to follow up and see, you know, where your status is at. And, um, but as far as the development, everything is it, is looking way better from from you know from uh, from then to now with the apartments. The heating is just like she was saying about the heating. It's like you know 
Sometimes we get hit, we sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's not working right. Sometimes they might have to come out late at night to do some adjustments or whatever on the heating. Because a lot of apartments is not getting heat. You know, a lot of um, uh, tenants are complaining about the heat. And it's in the last few days, it's been really cold in the apartment. So, you know, I just give them certain numbers, you know, uh, to the, like, the supers and stuff, who they can get in contact with it when there's you no... Know, when the heating problem is going down or whatever. But other than that, man, I don't really have too many complaints because um, um, I'm working, you know, I'm working now, you know. Uh, it took me a good while to get me a night, you know, a, 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 a gig, but, you know, once they came in with the new, with the new, a, a new development and stuff, and everything's went good for me, you know what I'm saying? I, I really don't have no complaints, no complaints whatsoever, but, um, but it's, it's, it's just the job wise for the younger guys, you know, because if you got them working, then that's less things they have to be doing out here in the street. You know, these guns is just shooting and stuff, you know, especially in my development, you know, we had a lot of that gun not and shooting anymore. stuff. No, 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 not no more. No, no, no. Everything's good now. It's 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 just calmed down because you know, a lot of guys is working now, you know, guys that's never worked, that's always been in the street hustling and stuff. So it's good, but we're just trying to get more of the younger guys working, you know what I'm saying? We're trying to get them working. Like I said, I, I I just tell them, you know, to put your resume in, you know, and just follow up on it. You know, follow up on your resume, you know, because it's openings. There's a lot of openings. There's definitely a lot of openings. But uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Moore. And did you get your position through Reese? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Reese, yes. To Mr. Reese. Uh, <clears throat> you testify that everything is okay yeah. in, that, in that development. Yeah. Hot water. Yeah, hot, it's, it's so, and I mean, you, you, you get you, you get hot water, and it, it switches. Sometimes we get it, the, the cold will be so cold. So people are not suffering there. People, no problem there. Nah, okay. not, nah, it's not, it, nah, it's not really no, nah, it's no suffering. No, no, no. It's basically the heat, you No. Know? Sometimes you get heat, sometimes you don't get heat. When do you get heat and when do you, when don't you get heat? Well, sometimes, okay, when you, okay, we like, the new system they put in, sometimes, like, when you turn turn it up, because, you know, you got numbers on the radio, so when you, yeah, the little, the little dials, you got numbers, so sometimes when you, when you turn it up, you might get a kicking sound. So it's not working? Huh? So the system is no, not working? No, it's not, no, it takes a while it's for it to kick in. It, you might have to turn it down to a next number, or you might have to put it exactly on the. So number. a senior citizen, an old person that doesn't, somebody that doesn't really know how to, how does it works for him? Say it again. I didn't hear you. So, like, someone that doesn't know is not as smart as you are. Uh huh. And with that system, how how does how the system works for that? Well, it's it's not really hard. You you just turn it to set the you got the numbers on the on the on on the dial. You know when you turn it. It has numbers from one to six, but sometimes when you turn to the number, like to far as the heat, it goes up. The highest it goes up is, is number six, but sometimes when you actually put it on the number, you might get a kicking sound. So sometimes you might have to turn it down to get to the next level, you know, just to get the kicking sound. But most of the time, it's you know, it's working. It's you no, know, you're not really getting too many problems with it. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's new and trying to just yeah, figure new, out a yeah. new system. Okay. Yeah, they still they still trying to figure so the out. Bottom, so the bottom line is that in that development, everybody's happy. Well, I can't say everybody's happy. We got 28 buildings in there, so I can't say that. I would hope that there's a, a level of excitement because we're talking about Ocean Bay, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can't. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, yeah. Mr. Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Stevens. Yeah. No. Next. Richard Stevens, uh, resident Alfred E. Smith Houses. Um, I uh, have been living on Social Security Disability for uh, a while and got an operation. This is uh, uh, many years ago, actually. And I have since been through uh, state agencies, nonprofits, city agencies, and have learned a great deal about bureaucracy and the difference between the nonprofit sector, government sector, and the business sector. Employment is, is very highly regulated in New York City. The prospects of somebody who's middle-aged and very long-term unemployed getting a decent job are very difficult. I happen to have 
no funding to pay for additional degrees or trainings. So uh, I uh, approached it in a, in a somewhat naive way over, uh, over the years and uh, have found uh, a lack of, I do free, some freelance work and make a little here and there, but I found a, a great lack of success, but I learned a great deal about um, the disastrous state of workforce development. It sounds nice, but many of the people, most of the people I run into, they don't have any idea how, what, what businesses need, how businesses think. They don't know how to identify transferable skills. So um, the specific problem that we have with, with um, the topic of this hearing, uh, the support system for that is so weak that uh, one can fund and hire people that one thinks are going to be qualified because of something's on their resume. But that doesn't mean they have the cognitive ability to be able to actually evaluate um, uh, opportunities, evaluate the prospect of uh, employee, and to actually get things done, make the phone calls, pitch to employers. And so um, I, as somebody, I, my skills are, the, many of these jobs are, are, are um, are um, blue-collar jobs, and I have blue-collar skills that I haven't used in a number of years, but I also have white scholar sk uh, skills in research compliance, uh, re uh, uh, legal, uh, legal work, and um, in investigation. And uh, some of those skills uh, certainly would fit into uh, uh, some of these um, uh, development programs covered under the topic of this hearing. Uh, but there's no, never the few contacts I've had with anybody uh, dealing with these programs, these Title III programs, have made no, uh, you know, effort to uh, even uh, want to discuss anything other than the uh, uh, the limited uh, blue collar jobs. I think that uh, uh, I would like to s see the uh, members of the committee consider uh, taking a very very strong look at all of workforce development in a very critical light and to get some advice from the get it done sector of, 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 uh, of the world, the business sector, and uh, bring in some uh, really experienced people and uh, 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 look for solutions because uh, I don't think uh, good intentions are gonna work here because the whole, the whole infrastructure of the workforce development is just, is just too shaky. And that's it. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. My name is Zyke Satoris, and I'm the president of Alfred E. Smith uh, Resident Association. Section 3. Um, one of the biggest things about Section 3 that people need to recognize is that the 964 has really never, has not been really looked at in terms of how the Section 3 functions, which is that the resident association, not the leader, but the resident association, should be part of the process, and we're not. And that in itself is a problem. Um, I have right now, uh, they're almost finished, a $56 million contract from the FEMA, and they hired ultimately six people. What's wrong with that figure? Part of it has been that what they've done is consolidated everybody and so people who worked in another development have now come here to work in Smith and so by the time they got to Alfred E. Smith there wasn't enough so-called section 3 positions open because they had been taken by others and that is a problem because it creates a situation I don't want anybody to lose their job but clearly there has to be defined lines of you know when the contract is in that development that the residents in that development get first pick. That's first choice. The other issue that I have is that the assumption is that there are people in public housing that have no degrees, have no office skills, have no knowledge of anything other than cleaning up after the contractors or skills. I will say that this administration has tried to do with the workforce. So I, and I actually have like five residents that graduated from the workforce, right? And they hooked up with unions and things like that, and that's the right trend. However, 
prior to this administration, and it's not about taking favors, but it's a real reality for me, the, the other two previous administrations did this. If you had a godfather, you got baptized, right? And as much as this administration has tried to kind of fix that, you know, we're talking about 20 years of that constant thing, of that being done. And it was not only in NYCHA, but across the board, because even in the DOE, that happened. Um, and so how do we begin to fix it? Follow the 964. Resident leaders should be at the conception of the contract, and we should talk about how many jobs are going to be done when the contract's being done, and how much money is really spent, and how much does the regulations actually say? Because it says 8% of the total budget. I did the math, and none of my residents that are, work that are working, okay, are making a quarter of a million dollars. They're not, you know. And so the higher paying jobs that are administrative don't go to the residents, and they're outsourced and things like that. And that has to be revisited. That really has to be, because it's, it's like, you know, we live in public housing, so we don't know how to read. We don't know how to write. Excuse me? I have three degrees. I am bilingual, fluently bilingual. And I'm, I'm an example. I'm not talking about me. But there are, like me, there's hundreds of residents with those kind of skills and with that kind of education. That we choose to live in public housing, we choose to live in, for whatever reasons. Um, and that, that's a real reality. And I think that if we're going to look at Section 3, we need to look at the reality of how many people are really being put, not in labor positions, but in administrative positions that they can continue. Because the thrust of Section 3 is that ultimately those companies will keep the residents as permanent residents. I don't want to hear, like I have one, one contractor tell me, he's had the same resident who's no longer a resident, okay, hired under Section 3 three for 15 years are you kidding me and that he's met his section three requirements i just looked at him i said do you think i'm stupid it was not a pretty meeting uh, let, okay for those of you who know me i was livid um because you know you're telling me that this person who doesn't even know my residence and that's the other part of the section three right is that if you hire residents and that is something that NYCHA has to revisit again. We used to have seasonal, thanks to the council, because the council used to um, pay for that. And those members, those residents that became seasonal ultimately became permanent workers. And I can tell you that I'm quite happy with my management. You know, we work together. We don't always agree, but we work together. Any issues that we have, we sit at the table. I have a grievance committee, and we talk about real issues. Um, in terms of heat, we have a roll call system, the association. We have a roll call. We have, and, and you know, if, if the heat goes out or the water goes out, every, we have somebody to call in every building. And then, you know, the director of, of heating met with us. Um, I was very impressed. <laughs> with the changes that he's made and hopefully they will make a difference. So those those are the kind of things that need to happen. But we clearly with section 3 they have to revisit it. They have to look at it and redo redefine, you know, what are the guidelines for residents working and what are the jobs that are going to be offered. Right? Cuz I if I were to I I can't put a hammer in a wall, right? because I'll make a hole in the wall. That I don't have those skills, but I do have other skills. And that's what I'm saying, that, you know, it has to be revisited. And one of the ways to first start revisiting is to sit with the resident leadership and say, okay, what is it? You know, we have, I, we have resumes. I think most TA presidents have resumes of a lot of the residents, a lot of the young people. And unlike, and I'm going to finish, unlike, you know, what the, what the, the press says and everybody else says and and the man in the White House thinks that we are the reality of it is that we're responsible citizens unlike him we pay taxes we pay rent and damn I you know like I retired and I'm still paying taxes on my pension you know that that we we are responsible for Smith houses the original residents were veterans um 
And so we've paid our dues. And so I think that what one of the things that needs to happen is that Section 8, that's my recommendation, has to be revisited, has to be re-looked at, and we need to look at the, I mean, Section 3. I'm sorry, because I'm thinking about something else. Section 3 has to be revisited, has to be looked at, and the resident leadership, and we need to look at, you know, what those numbers are and what the realities are in terms of what jobs are offered to our residents that's a reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Torres, and thank you so much um, to the residents of New York City Housing Authority um, for your testimony today. And again, that's the purpose of having you come up first so that NYCHA will speak directly to what we've heard. So thank you so much. And we've been joined by Council Member Donovan Richards. And so joining us today, representing the New York City Housing Authority, will be Sadia Sherman, Executive Vice President of the Community Engagement and Partnerships Division, as well as Esther Hines, the Senior Deputy Director for Vendor Integ Integrity and Supplier Diversity. Well, that was a lot. So please join us. And we've also just been joined by Council Member Carlos Machaca and Council Member Diana Ayala. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of your testimony for these committees and to respond honestly to Council Member questions? I do. Chair Zalika Amprey Samuel and I, Danique Miller, members of the Committee on Public Housing and Civil Service and Labor, and other distinguished guests of the City Council. Good afternoon. I'm Sidia Sherman, NYCHA's Executive Vice President for Community Engagement and Partnerships. Joining me today are Divi Director of Vendor Integrity and Supplier Diversity, Esther Thomasich Hines, and other members of NYCHA's team. Connecting residents to high quality job training and employment opportunities is a crucial part of our mission to improve the quality of life of our residents. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this work today. Since we last discussed this topic with the council in 2016, we've made progress in connecting residents to employment and are pleased to share with you some of the highlights of these efforts. We recently announced nearly 15,000 resident job placements since 2014. The significant milestone was made possible by the work of our Office of Resident Economic Empowerment and Sustainability, which is devoted to helping NYCHA residents increase their income and assets through strategic partnerships. Since 2015, about 5,700 residents were hired through Section 3. This includes residents hired by the authority via uh, our NYCHA Resident Training Academy and Super, Superstorm Sandy Recovery Funding. The NRTA is a key REITs program that provides residents training in construction, janitorial services, and pest control, equipping them with the knowledge, skills, and industry certifications they need to succeed. Since its inception in 2010, more than 2,100 residents have, have graduated from the NRTA, over 90% of whom have gained employment at NYCHA or with NYCHA vendors and employers. In recent years, NYCHA's and the NRTA's success in hiring and, and workforce development have been recognized by the New York City Employment and Training Coalition and the New York Association of Training and Employment Professionals, respectively. As the largest housing, public housing authority in the country, NYCHA is committed to generating jobs and other economic opportunities for residents through our spending and direct hiring. Section 3 is one tool to achieve that goal. Section 3 is a HUD regulation that requires recipients of HUD financial assistance to generate jobs and other economic opportunities for public housing residents and other low-income members of the community to the greatest extent feasible. The goal is that 30% of new hires are Section 3 hires. 
that is, NYCHA residents or other low-income members of the community. NYCHA regularly reviews the certifications of new hires submitted by contractors to see that contractors meet or exceed the 30% threshold. Of the nearly 900 Section 3 monitor contracts that were closed out between 2016 through 2018, 98% were in compliance with the Section 3 requirements. Of the 2%, 1% demonstrated th that they attempted to comply with the requirements to the greatest extent feasible, and 1% are currently being evaluated. NYCHA reports Section 3 hiring figures to HUD annually. We provide our overall resident job placement data every month to the city as part of the citywide performance report and the mayor's management report. In addition, we will publish a report on Section 3 compliance for closed contracts twice per year on our website in furtherance of our transparency efforts. The NRTA supports the pool of residents qualified to meet contractors' needs. Residents interested in working on a Section 3 project can get their skills, interests, and qualifications assessed at Reese's info, session, info sessions at our central office or off-site. They are then connected to partner providers and can be added to Reese's database from which referrals to contractors can be made based on the position and the skill set requirement. Reese also works to connect residents to economic opportunity beyond Section 3 through its partnerships with local service providers. In addition to our regular capital program, our rental assistance demonstration work is subject to Section 3, and NYCHA has taken additional steps of applying Section 3 to our Sandy Recovery project, projects. We also incorporate resident hire, hiring requirements for other real estate development activities, energy contracts, and more. NYCHA has implemented several, in, several internal enhancements over the years to increase Section 3 hiring, such as centralized Section 3 oversight and compliance, improved tracking and monitoring of hiring, diversified employment offerings, and better oversight of Section 3 requirements. NYCHA also created a Section 3 business concern regist registry, which contractors and vendors can access online. Section 3 business concerns are businesses that are at least 51% owned by Section 3 residents or at least 30% staffed by Section 3 residents or that will subcontract at least 25% of their award to Section 3 business concern. In addition, NYCHA regularly promotes contracting opportunities for Section 3 business concerns and minority and women-owned business enterprises. Under Interim Chair and CEO Stanley Brezhnev's leadership, the authority is undertaking a number of initiatives to transform this agency. As part of these efforts, NYCHA is making improvements related to Section 3, which for an organization of NYCHA size can be complex to implement. For instance, moving forward, we will specify Section 3 hiring, hiring requirements in the terms and conditions for micro-purchases and some small procurements, for example, those under $5,000. This was a compliance vulnerability that we identified. We are also implementing new tracking measures and developing updated procedures and training for staff. One of the goals of NYCHA's project labor agreement with the Building and Construction Trade Council is to provide residents with access to union jobs and training. We've requested data on these efforts from the, from the BCTC and look forward to receiving that information. We're currently renegotiating the PLA with lessons learned from the past three years and Section 3 hiring as at the forefront of these discussions. NYCHA 2.0, our updated long-term strategic plan, is dedicated in part to increasing economic opportunities for residents by connecting more residents to jobs and job training and education programs every year. That includes expansion of the NRTA with city funding to train an additional 250 NYCHA residents annually, a 70% increase this marks the first time uh, the city has funded this valuable initiative. Additionally, NYCHA will hire more NRTA and recruitment, r recruitment and job placement staff. We are also excited about the recent announcement of the expansion of the Jobs Plus program. This interagency partnership is designed to exclusively serve NYCHA residents and has been integral to the success of our resident employment efforts. Thank you for your support of our efforts to provide residents with economic opportunity. This work has real and lasting positive impact on our communities. City funding will go a long way in serving NYCHA residents, particularly with the expansion of the NRTA and Jobs Plus. We look forward to working with you as we identify additional funding for these and new initiatives, and as we continue to make improvements and progress within our organization. Thank you, and we are happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Ms. Sherman.
So just to get us started, um, and for the record, can you just um, explain the actual Section 3 um, hiring process in the Section 3 regulation itself? And, um, and can you speak to um, a point that we constantly hear from residents that they see people working on these different jobs, but the people that are working they don't know them or they're not from the development. And um, Ms. Torres sat here and talked about what's happening at Smith, mm -hmm. but yet there's just, um, just looking at the work that, the um, paperwork that you provided us, there's just one person um, from the development that's uh, working there in 2018. So can you explain to us what Section 3 actually is and what NYCHA's requirement is under that regulation? And one of the things speak, also speak directly to the point of 30% of the new, the new hirees, just to give us some background. Sure. So so I'll actually start with just um, a clarification. Um, so this, are you, were you, council member, you so I'm referring so, to the document that was handed to us that lists the total number of Section 3 residents directly hired by NYCHA in 2018, and it breaks down um, by all five boroughs. So, so yes, yeah, so, th so this document is capturing folks who were um, within our employee here at NYCHA. What we are producing also for the council members are is a breakdown of vendor hires as well too, but I wanted to just make sure that the, the full council um, understands that with respect to this report. So um, with regard to the requirements, so section three um, requirements are 30% of new hires. So that means that someone who is not your incumbent employee, um, but is hired as a result of this project. Um, the, the regulation um, is designed so that there is not an intent for an employer to lay off its incumbent workforce, but to the extent that it needs to hire to ensure that at least 30% of those new hires are Section 3 residents. Section 3 residents are NYCHA residents or low-income persons. Um, there is a waterfall of priority, and so that priority starts with residents who live where the Section 3 covered assistance is being administered, so that would be residents who work where, live where the work is occurring. Um, the second priority would be NYCHA residents citywide, so anyone who is a, sex, uh, a public housing resident. The third priority would be uh, uh, low-income persons who have graduated from a youth bill program specifically, so those would be 16 to 18 to 24-year-olds, um, and then other low-income New Yorkers. And so um, the out of our Section 3 placements with vendors, about 50% of those placements are uh, residents who are working either at their development or within their borough. 30% are residents who are working in a borough other than their own, um, and the remainder are typically residents who are working on citywide contracts. And so some of what ha what you see on the ground um, is a reflection of where we are attempting to match residents um, based on the skill set requirement of the position, r matching residents where they live to where they work in positions where they meet the qualifications. Um, but also what you see happening on the ground is a reflection of how NYCHA contracts work as well, whereas we may have citywide contracts that cover multiple developments. Um, and so you may have a contract at uh, Baruch Houses and have a contract at Smith and have a contract at Wald, and it would still be one contract. Um, typically what we would do in that process is when a contract is awarded, there is a notice that goes through the Resident Association to let them know there's a new award. These this is the projection of hires. Um, if you know people are interested, please connect them with our office so they can be connected to training. Um, but sometimes it, you will see residents who are NYCHA residents but do not live at the development where they're working. So using Alfred E. Smith as an example, do you have the information in front of you that states like how much was the contract, how many people were actually hired under that contract to work at Smith Houses, and how many of them were NYCHA residents? So I don't, but we can obtain that for you. Um, and so we can we can look into those specific contracts. I know that the work occurring at Smith Houses is part of our recovery program in particular. Um, and so there was training specifically for residents who live in, in areas that were impacted by Sandy. So we can get that information to you as well as um, that specific contract that was referenced. So if they were specific training catered to those particular residents at Smith Houses, then it should be theoretically a higher number of residents who were working at that particular site because they were specifically trained. Yes, or those Smith residents could also be working, working in Coney somewhere. Island, for instance, right? So so there is there may be, based on how like their access to training and matching up to opportunities, um, they're even within the, the areas where we have the recovery program, people are still working between neighborhoods based on the priority. 
Okay, so for this discussion, it would be helpful to get those numbers during the course of this mm -hmm. hearing um, so that, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to be able to, to have a visual and be able to use it as an example so that we can, you know, like kind of dive into what's happening and, um, you know, if there's any gaps or improvements necessary. Okay, so um, you mentioned in your testimony the announcement from recently announced, that was yesterday, um, 15,000 resident job placements since 2014. Okay. Um, and then you go into since 2015, about 5,700 were hired through the Section 3. And then that kind of like just doing quick math, it leaves with there's some 9,300 other positions or hiring um, within that 15,000 number. So can you break down for us what does that 15,000 actually look like? Sure. So that 15,000 is a reflection of all of our resident employment efforts during this administration. So that's a mix of Section 3, Jobs Plus, employer par other employer partnerships that are not subject to Section 3. Um, so the Section 3 numbers, the 5,700, reflect the last three years. Um, there are about 70, 7,300 placements through Jobs Plus alone, um, and then there's a gap between... So what does that mean, through Jobs Plus alone? Can so, you explain that? Sure, sure, sure. So Jobs Plus is a program, um, it's an interagency program that is specifically serves, that specifically serves NYCHA residents. Um, it is operated in conjunction with HRA, NYC Opportunity, and the Young Men's Initiative, um, and it's a real integral part of, of our, our workforce efforts. And so those placements are primarily private sector in place, uh, employment opportunities um, and range across a number of industries and so that's part of what was included in that announcement and then the balance are a lot of our uh, construct range across industries what does that mean sure so um, I would say that uh, I don't have an exact breakout in percentage but um, the jobs plus placements are everything from retail to food industry to building maintenance administrative secretary clerical we can certainly get that for you um, the jobs plus clientele is also um, you know, serves all NYCHA residents, but it also has been very effective with young adults. And so there's a, a large percentage who are 16 to 24 within those placements as well. Okay. How does NYCHA alert residents to job opportunities? So um, for Section 3 in particular, when a contract is awarded, as, as noted, um, we provide notice to the resident association. Typically, the administering department would include the resident association in pre-start meetings as well so that they have that knowledge. Um, residents who register their interest in Section 3 opportunities with our office are often as, are also queried um, based on the skill set requirement and where they live so that they can know these opportunities are coming online. Um, outside of that, we've had very targeted recruitment for large-scale hiring initiatives. Um, this includes our training academy, where there's regular recruitment for cohort-based training. Um, some of our partner partnerships with the, the Workforce One system, for instance, where there's been large-scale recruitment for very specific hiring opportunities. But um, there is a mix between uh, on-site recruitment and then notice to candidates based on the position skill set requirements. Okay, just real quick. Um, so just so I can understand, I. There's a lot going on, and, and you're doing an amazing job, and the 15,000 number is it's, it's a really good number. Um, can you explain to us the, the, the non-compliance issue that we read about in reference to um, just the Section 3 practice and, and, and policy at NYCHA? Um, we, we read that NYCHA was not in compliance with this Section 3. So can you explain to us what that, like, what were you not in compliance with? Mm -hmm. So for that, I'm, I'm going to um, turn it over to my colleague Esther, who can describe. Um, and the reason I'm asking this question is because what, everything that you just said sounds amazing, mm -hmm. right? And then the panel that we heard, the, the resident panel right before you, um, spoke to what they see on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so to me, there's a bit of a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to, to, to fill some gaps here, some holes, and really try to get a full breath and understanding of what's really happening. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, should, I get sworn in? Yeah. should I get sworn in before I testify? I did? I thought you did. We can do it again. Oh. Maybe I was <laughs> nervous and I forgot. My name is my name is Esther Thomasich Hines. <laughs> Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. So I think some of the concerns that you express um, regarding the public information around Section 3 compliance and the Housing Authority's um, lack of compliance really is based on our information that we provided to HUD in, um, in for full, full disclosure, and it really relates to um, notifying vendors for our very small micro purchases and small purchases um, those that have been um, for example under five thousand dollars that the section three language is not in those particular contracts um, so we are working to make sure that we include it in those micro and small purchase contracts across the board so that everybody is notified of Section 3 obligations. Um, so we identified that as a compliance gap and we're working to correct that and we hope to have it corrected um, by the second quarter of 2019. So your testimony today is that the only um, issue that you have with compliance was exclusively related to the micro um, purchases and the small procurements only. N nothing at all related to um, the possibility of, um, you know, just not hiring residents when there was an opportunity to hire them. That, the Noncompliance is exclusively related to. That is correct. That is correct. Okay. Okay. Um, so now I, I have a lot of other questions, but I'll turn it over to um, my co-chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Samuels. Be before I, I, I kind of venture off into the other line of question, I, I do want to, I, we need some clarification on, on, on what you just mentioned about compliance, because I know that we recently had this conversation and we were certainly not where we are today. So I'd like to kind of drill down on what that compliance looks like um, because we, we were not able to, uh, we weren't afforded these numbers um, in the recent past. So um, you say that 98% of contractors were in Section 3 compliance. Um, what is the time period for that? So we, the information regarding the 98% relates to um, the contracts that we monitored and closed for um, be January of 2016 through December of 2018. For, so for that period of time, when those contracts closed, that's when we could determine whether or not contractors were compliant with their Section um, 3 so, obligations. So based on what you just said that there is an opportunity there is uh generally a, a three-year contract awarded in that time period for, for these for, for, for the purposes of what we're saying now no, the um the contracts i'm uh i'm speaking of were contracts that closed um the contracts could have varied in in time they could have been a five-year contract that closed in 2016 or okay so the, and, and, and your determination as to whether a, per, uh, a, a contractor was in compliance was based on the close of the contract? That is correct, sir. So from if it was a five-year contract from year one to year four, you have no way of knowing whether or not they were in compliance? Well, we, we track those contracts um, to see if the, if the vendor is in compliance with their goals. And I think it's important. Were there any contractors that were not in compliance in year one, two, three, or four, to your knowledge? There were, sir. Um, there was a, the, out of the 98% of contracts that closed within that period of time that we found to be in compliance with their section three goals, of 30%, which 30% or more exceeded their hires. There was 1% um, that cited some labor impediments, approximately 10 contractors, and there were nine contractors um, that were not compliant with the 30% goal. It's, it's important so to So I'm sorry, what, the question that I asked specifically was, um, had to do with chronological. In year one, how many were in compliance year two, year three, year four? Do you know that? 
if, if you use as an example that it could have been a five-year compliance, if we're examining compliance at only the fifth year, did the residents of NYCHA have an opportunity? Uh, were, were they taking advantage of those opportunities in the first four years or in the first three years or whatever length of the contract it is? It appears that we are judging the contract by its closing or its completion and not necessarily what they did through the totality of the program, right? I, I mean, it, it makes sense that is there a way for us to know that? And if, and, and if in fact, is a person that has a three or a five year contract that did not meet their compliance uh, uh, requirements in the first three years, in year four, in the final year, do we deem them to be in compliance first? That's the question I'd like to ask first. So we monitor a, um, the contractor's compliance over the course of their contract. There are some contractors who hire at the, at the beginning of their contract with NYCHA, and this is related to new hires only. The contractor's obligations um, for Section 3, 30% or above goals, are related to new hires specifically. And some contracts um, hire people on the front end of the contract. Some contractors hire more in the midpoint of the contract, and some contractors hire new people towards the back end of the contract. So we monitor the new hires and the Section 3 hires throughout the life of the contract to ensure that, um, that, that they are meeting their goals throughout the life of the contract. Once the contract closes, then, you know, um, that gives us the broad picture of whether or not the contractor was in compliance. I'm not so sure that's the case. I'm not sure. If I was trying to evade compliance, uh, certainly there's a lot of latitude based on what you said for that to happen, for me not to hire for three years or four years or within a certain portion of the contract. And then there's also this kind of, uh, from, from this side of the table here, I, I think that our greater concern is, is not whether or not someone is complying and hiring 30 percent. It is more about retention, career creation, and opportunity. And, 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 and so based on those numbers, we're not able to ascertain whether or not we're achieving long-term goals of whether or not that we are creating career opportunities for the residents of, of NYCHA. And so if, in fact, that is the case, and that is the mechanism that is being used today, then I, I would submit that we should uh, take the opportunity to examine the current mechanism that we're using and see whether or not that we're uh, fully taking advantage of the program and that we're not creating loopholes for unscrupulous contractors to, to avoid and evade uh, compliance here. And, and, and certainly, um, the reason that we have this line of question is because we've, we've seen that. And, and, and certainly, when we listen to the testimony that was given earlier about whether residents of a certain uh, 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 um, development was going to follow that company to the next development and therefore lessening the uh, uh, opportunities for the residents of that. If, if a company um, does capital work, um, I'm sure that they're not exclusive to NYCHA or government contracts or NYCHA contract, but they're not work, their only work is not only in the next NYCHA development. So that once a person develops the skill set um, to work, that they can work anywhere beyond NYCHA and holding on to those single or two or three NYCHA residents and carrying them uh, from job site to job site uh, will maintain that compliance. And I think that we're cheating ourselves in achieving our overall goals if we uh, agree that, that, that this mechanism currently is, is the way that we want to go, that there's an opportunity to train um, 
folks for sustainable jobs and ensure that they're getting sustainable jobs and we're not just using the same numbers as we go past. So whether or not that is the case now or whether you want to expand on that, perhaps there's something else that we can do to evaluate whether or not a company is in compliance or not. Um, but that's what where I would like to begin. Um, because I, I just don't see that working um, in the way that we, whether or not we, we are achieving the goals that we set out, right? And so, um, which is long-term uh, sustainable career opportunities and, and training. And so I, I would like to talk, so that's the first piece. Um, and then um, nearly almost exactly half of the jobs were outside of NYCHA and, and, and that's the same thing that we want to talk about, whether or not we're seeing what we commonly see in workforce development, which are uh, uh, kind of proliferation of low-wage, uh, fast-food, retail jobs. Uh, and I understand that they are entry level, but could you speak to also the um, training and development that occurs in the workforce development that prepares not just for entry level, but are there specific um, job skills that we're training for, that you have identified, even if they are long-term capital programs, uh, how, how do we ensure that residents are, and including the kind of the backroom IT and, and administrative work that is being done as well, right, that there are a plethora of long-term contracts or even add them up years of capital projects that are happening, is it then worth it to um, ensure that we're training for those more transferable skills, uh, IT, admin, the backroom stuff, which is not a big deal. Other agencies do it. Does, is NYCHA doing that? Sure. So I can, I can speak to the question regarding training. Um, so within NYCHA, um, we manage a network of partners across the city who offer residents training. Um, this is across a variety of sectors, and so um, the, we have a partnership around IT training that's been generously funded and supported through the council. Um, we have training in the healthcare sector, um, administrative. Um, within NYCHA, we manage a resident training academy, um, which is specifically designed for the types of jobs that we typically generate, which are building maintenance and construction positions. Um, so that program on the construction side in particular um, is an eight-week pre-apprenticeship training. Um, it's really designed to ensure that residents have uh, OSHA certification, but other certifications. So they graduate with around six different certifications. Um, they have a rotation in a number of trades. They have contextualized mathematics, classroom time, um, real-world experience. And so that's been our training vehicle in that area. Um, I think you, you also asked a question regarding wages. Um, so. Um, within our placements through partners, and particularly the, the Jobs Plus program, um, the, the median wage last year was around $14.95 per hour, um, which precedes the, the, the new minimum wage increase um, and, and is also reflective of uh, the, the types of um, jobs that they're connecting folks to, which are a mix of entry level and mid level. Um, on the Section 3 and uh, NYCHA direct placement side, the median wage was around $21 per hour. Um, and there's a real range there, so there certainly are Section 3 positions um, that are back office or security, for instance, as you mentioned, um, but most of these are in the construction trades. Um, our top titles are mason tenders, laborers, asbestos handle handlers, um, and those average wages were between $38 and $39 an hour. And so there, there certainly is a range based on the experience level. Um, and also between the placements that NYCHA facilitates directly, as well as those that are um, connect, where our partners are making that connection. So, so, um, so let me just segue into uh, one of your one of your programs that that are being instituted with the <coughs> with the painters and and uh, district council nine. Um, could you speak to that program, the success, the success of the program or lack thereof, and, and, and what you're doing or what we could be doing differently to enhance a program such as this? 
Sure. So I'm going to ask um, uh, my colleague, Kerry Jew, who's the Chief Administrative Officer at NYCHA, to describe that program. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I'm Carrie Ju. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer at NYCHA. And I believe the question um, that you asked, sir, was about the Painter's Apprentice Program? Okay, so, um, so just a, a snapshot of where we stand now. As you know, the program started in 2013. Um, and for the first uh, two or three years, we enrolled uh, new members into the program. So the program had a total of 155 enrollees. Um, currently, there are, and, and several either stayed with the program um, and graduated, or they separated from NYCHA and from the program. Um, currently, we have 22 employees remaining in the program, uh, two of which are on workers' comp. So we have 20 active employees in the program. Um, has the program, has this contract been completed? The what, what, what is the completion, anticipated completion date? So we are funded for the program through June 30th of this year. Um, and, and then at that point, um, we would no longer have any funding to, to complete the program for the remaining participants. And, and what would be the cost of the, the next contract to complete the work? Uh, what to do the next level of the work? Obviously, this is an ongoing um, project. And could you just speak to also what, what, what this includes? So the program uh, requires that the participants complete um, a certain number of hours on the, on the job, employed hours, um, and then, and I believe it comes to about four years of on the job experience, and then there's also classroom training that's provided by the Finishing Trades Institute um, that goes along with, with the program. So that, that's what the participants are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as you know, we're not enrolling any additional people. We haven't been for a few years now. Um, so um, it would just be a matter of uh, completing the program for the really 20 active employees through the end of the year. Um, I believe it would cost probably approximately, and this is really back of the envelope, trying to guess, about $400,000 um, additional to complete, but we would have to confirm that number. So um, what, what the, the, the contract with, with, uh, with DC-9, uh, aside for the apprenticeship, was that a part of a PLA agreement? The apprenticeship program, I yes. don't believe that was part of a PLA agreement. Okay, so um, what work were, were, were they performing? Because they're working aside, aside from the training that goes on there, they're working aside tradesmen and journeymen over there. What works were they performing? They're painting? So they're painter apprentices. So they're, they're working directly as NYCHA employees, mm -hmm. not for a vendor. But, but right. And, but the jobs that are being done are contracted. Is that just specifically a part of the painter's uh, uh, apprentice program? Or are this uh, a part of, uh, do they have a contract to, to paint apartments or uh, some other exteriors of the building? The DC-9. The DC-9. The DC-9 is a union that is representing the NYCHA-employed painters and the NYCHA-employed painter mm -hmm. apprentices. So we don't have a contract for DC-9 to Okay. So work. what would it cost to, to uh, do another three years of the program? I would have to get back to you and see what that cost would be. I think it would also it would depend on how many people we would enroll in the program. So you said you had about 130 in total? No, I said that 
in total, we had had 155 since 2013, oh. but s some of those people have graduated Correct. out of the program. Uh, some of those have chosen to not continue. And right now, we you have, know what those numbers are? We had 48 who completed the program and, and graduated. Um, and we had 90 who left the program. Okay. And do you know why they left? Uh, for a variety of reasons. I, I couldn't be specific about So without asking you to be specific, the, the, if, if, if this was a contractor, um, with, with compliance, this is the same thing in, in terms of are we getting banged for our book, I think is what we're trying to assess here. Um, certainly, we think common sense would say that an opportunity to uh, be a part of a trade union and, and have a long-term career is the best way to transition to real uh, working middle class opportunities, right, in doing so. but. It would, we'd be remiss if we did not evaluate whether or not this program had real value, considering that those were council dollars that, that were spent on the program and whether or not we want to re up and do it again. Certainly, if there were 150 men and women that had uh, 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 real career opportunities that are now card carrying members of, of, of a trade union, that would be well worth it. But if, in fact, that's not the case, we need to know that as well. How do we evaluate that? Are we, are, are we paying attention to that retention? And at the same time, are we, um, do we have a mechanism to evaluate that as in uh, the compliance with the regular contractors? So I, I'm not sure that I'm quite understanding what the question is. Uh, 48 of the people who were originally enrolled actually graduated from the program. My understanding is that upon graduation from the program, in order to become a journey level painter, they required one more year of experience. Um, some of the people, when they were to be graduated out of the program, decided that in, instead of sort of testing their luck outside um, and getting a painter's apprentice type job to get the experience in the private sector or wherever, that they really wanted to be NYCHA employees with city benefits. And so they wanted to take caretaker positions with NYCHA in order to continue their city employment. Okay, that, that wasn't really the question that I was asking. It was really about, uh, you know, how do we track this? retention and and so but I, I want to move on from there I, and to, want, I, mm. I would like for you to, to why did we why do we put time and energy into a um, four-year program knowing that in order to be a city employee as a, like a painter city employee is actually five years um, just so I I don't know how this agreement came up but this is all this all predated me um, so I don't know what how the parameters were set. I would have to go back and, and see if anybody has any recollection or, or notes. Okay. Okay. So, do you have that information that if you wanted to share it offline? Or is it, is it, is it like, I'm, I'm sure it's not the case that it's not your money and you don't care, <laughs> right? But like we want to make sure that, that these services are being delivered effectively and efficiently and that, that, that our residents, these NYCHA residents, are now have the skill to continue to do that as we move forward. So that's obviously the goal. And, I'm, so, and, and then just um, in terms of um, the project labor agreements uh, is, is up in, in 18. Um, have, we, have we evaluated that, the, the, uh, the impact of, of that agreement? or um, I'm, I'm sure when it's done that we'll, we'll assess that for its uh, efficiency, its, its effectiveness, its cost effectiveness on, in delivering the services and whether or not those agreement uh, help to create these job opportunities as well. Could, you, could someone speak to the PLA agreements? 
Sure, Council Member. So um, you're correct, the uh, project labor agreement um, is at the point of renewal. Um, and so there has been a temporary extension through this quarter, um, and NYCHA and the building trades are starting those discussions around renewal. Um, at the core of that discussion is resident hiring in Section 3 and making sure residents have access to the trades. And so um, part of that evaluation will involve uh, receiving from the building trades reports around NYCHA resident access during the term of the agreement. Um, we certainly have knowledge of those residents that we've directly connected, but um, the building trades members, um, through their their own efforts uh, per the agreement have also outreach as well too so that will be part of that evaluation um, and in a key part of um, our, our negotiation moving forward so um, there is some information that is shared some uh, some information beyond obviously the uh, what is necessary um, before we get into whether or not before you evaluate the success of, but whether or not, if in fact, assuming that it is successful, um, do we have a workforce that is prepared just based, based on those pre-apprentice uh, skills that are necessary to, to begin immediately, mm -hmm. right? So that, as we talk about, so that we have compliance through the, through, throughout the length of, of the agreement, um, or have we uh, assessed the program so that we can take those uh, that information back and, and ensure that we have that next generation of labor or whatever it is that mm -hmm. that, that is waiting in queue mm -hmm. to to be a part of the program. Um, so is there dialogue? Is there a uh, a department within uh, NYCHA that is responsible um, for this relationship and? and how has it been thus far? Sure, so um, in terms of pre-apprenticeship training, um, so as I mentioned before, NYCHA has um, its own construction training. Our Sandy Recovery Program also has its own pre-apprentice construction training. Um, there are partners that we work with, such as Non-Traditional Employment for Women and other CBOs who also have training. And so we are certainly connecting residents to um, the pipeline of pre-apprenticeship training that is available. The Building Trades itself um, also sponsors pre-apprenticeship training so that some of the data that we're waiting back um, that we're seeking from them to understand how many NYCHA residents went through, through their training as well. Um, so that we have a number of pipelines that are preparing residents to enter into the trades. Um, in terms of how, how it's gone, um, we have worked with um, very particular locals um, where we have certainly established strong relationships, um, referral relationships, local three uh, electricians, local one bricklayers, um, roofers, for instance, where we have um, developed a substantive referral process. Um, with local three in particular, um, through partnership with Small Business Services, we've been able to um, create a few cohorts of um, academic prep for the local three electricians test, which is very rigorous. Um, and so through that, we've had over 34 um, Section 3 residents who've been able to pass the aptitude test and make it into the electricians union, which is really exciting. Um, but we want to see more of that in, in a renewed agreement. And so while we certainly have developed these direct entry relationships with a number of the signatories, our expectation is that NYCHA residents are entering all the trades um, that are part of the building, uh, building trades. Um, and so that's part of the exchange that we're looking for, and it is certainly key to the renegotiation. So finally, would, 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 so do you anticipate that a renewal of the agreement uh, would be the same as what we've seen, or are there some things that we've learned that would enhance uh, the, the resident experience and opportunities, and in particular as it pertains to the building trades and having an opportunity and understanding rules of engagement, what must be done? in preparation and quite frankly um, that there is something more than we're going to train you to take an exam. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we would, um, so it means many of the lessons learned um, include making sure that we, we have a regular practice around that data sharing, um, making sure that the apprentice slots across the trades are, um, are clearly designated for NYCHA residents and that they're accessing them. Um, we certainly still need some additional support for academic preparation for certain trades. Um, and so we, we, we seek to have that in, comp in conjunction with the building trades. Um, and there, obviously, the PLA does not only apply to hiring. It covers 
um, much of our capital program. So there are a number of points that would be subject to that renegotiation. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, we have been joined by Council Member Traeger. And um, before I go to Council Member King, I just want to point, point of clarification um, because I have a, a note here from, um, from one of the painters. Um, it's five years to be considered a city employee painter, right? And the question I have, because the note that I was sent, NYCHA will only accept the apprentice program as two and a half years experience, even though they trained for four years. So I just want to get some clarification as to what would it take to actually become a, 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 a city employee painter with NYCHA and the program that you have that's four years, the training program, um, it looks like this is saying that, that NYCHA will only accept two and a half of those years. So can you just clarify? So the, the minimum qualifications for the civil service title of painter, which is I think the equivalent of a journey level painter, is five years of experience. The painter's apprentice experience, um, I believe counts as half for the time that they are uh, serving as apprentices with in this program I don't know and I would have to go back and find out the in terms of the history of the program how that was arrived at or agreed to so they can so they can be in the program for four years and apply for and then go someplace else and get another year and have a total of five years in some level of a like a training journeyman program but NYCHA will look at it as two and a half years so they would need to so if they're in the program for four years, my understanding is that that counts as two years of experience, and then they would need to get an additional three years of experience to make the five years of journey level um, or, or, or civil service minimum qualified, minimally qualified painter. Okay. Is this, is this uh, minimum qualifications and, and civil service titles, yes, it's DCAS and Civil Service Commission. Thank you. So next we'll hear from Council Member King, followed by Council Member Menchaca. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Chair. I um, want to thank both of you today for today's conversation. Um, I'm listening to the words coming out of both of your mouth, I'm excited by a lot of things that you're saying, but there's a lot coming out at the same time. So I'm just going to randomly just bounce around. Um, but I do want to start um, following up with um, Chair Miller when he was talking about how we are evaluating the program and the success to be able to retain folks or what the plan will look like. So my question to follow up on what he was talking about, is there an evaluation sheet or an interview when they complete the program so you get an idea of why people are staying or why people are leaving so you can correct and evaluate? Because then that gives us a better idea. Do we continue to fund the program? That's not really all that successful. If the people there not being not happy when they leave because they don't want to stick and stay, or they want to try, or just move on, and say I'm done with this, or quit halfway through. What is your measuring stick to guide all of that, to get, so we can gauge that? Sure. So, um, with respect to the painter apprenticeship program itself, um, my understanding is that there's not been uh, an evaluation. Um, I think there's been information exchange. Um, with the council, but not a formal evaluation. Um, for programs where there's an actual enrollment, like our training academy, for instance, and completion, um, we, we track retention for those uh, candidates for at least one year post-appointment. Um, and so on the construction side, at least 80% remain employed after a year, which is a pretty strong retention. Um, and across the other tracks that we've had, it's similar. Um, one of the things that we're looking to do with a program expansion is to actually bring in some CBO partners who can partner with us on the training academy so that that gap where we see folks who um, drop off at their one year mark if there are um, other supports that they need that we have local partners that are, are assisting in that way. Um, our, our, our other CBO partners such as Jobs Plus or groups like Green City Force or uh, Brooklyn Workforce Innovations, bed -Stuy, those are a lot of the CBOs we work with. They also have their own um, retention and tracking metrics. Okay. Um, you've answered um, my question, and I appreciate that. Um, I would also ask when there's another meeting or you're bringing the information. I would like to know 
how do you actually, ha what kind of in conversations that you have? It's like when someone leaves a job that's an exit interview. Mm -hmm. What kind of in training programming interviews do you have so we can better evaluate how the person felt about the mm -hmm. program? So if you can help me get that information, help us get the information, or if it doesn't exist, maybe that, that, that should be something that we use to help us also analyze mm -hmm. what those couple of months of training did for the individual that walked through the doors. Um, Looking at the list of residents, um, Section 3 residents, now I've listened to the conversation with Ms. Torres and a few others. I know um, in the NYCHAs that I have a five NYCHAs, and I do get complaints um, in regards to the people who are working there on the grounds. So I want to steer the next couple of questions in that direction to the Section 3, because I knew when I was growing up that one of the greatest things that inspired some of the brothers who were working in the NYCHA development that group is that they worked where they lived. And that what it helped also do, it helped the, the, the NYCHA community be that, much, be that much more respectful to the environment that they lived in. Why? Because Malik, who lived on the seventh floor, was responsible for keeping the grounds clean. So if I'm hanging out with Malik when Malik is not working, I'm not trying to mess up the environment that Malik got to clean up each and every day because he's part of the family environment in the NYCHA development. I think that was a great thing that the Section 3 is supposed to do. Somewhere along the line, that flavor is not in NYCHA the way it should be. You have people who are, who are part of Section 3 pro, who are not part of the NYCHA development, who come, I've had in my development, Boston Seacore, I asked a guy one time, I said, where are you from? He says, I live in Brooklyn. I'm trying to figure out how do you get to Brooklyn to come to the North Bronx to do your job? And if it's a bad snow day, he doesn't show up. So. I want to know how do you ensure in this Section 3 program that the people are supposed to be from a night to development that they live in? How do you ensure that they are actually part of that night to development? That's, that's my number one question. Also, I want to know in the process where there is everyday staff. How do you judge and make sure that allows that everyday staff or, and I mean administration as grounds, are from the same mm -hmm. pro, um, project area, housing develop as well? Um, my third question would be is when we start talking about um, retention, uh, in a, when a project is concluded, does that individual who's passed the test, who's been part of this Section 3 program, if, the, if they're part of this hired for a project, when that project is over, does that person gets terminated, whatever, ha whatever happens to that individual that determines retention, do they get someplace, sent someplace else because they've, they've acquired a good skill of being a roofer or being a good, or no, whatever that project is. And if that does happen, that they get sent to another development, how does that conflict with the person who's supposed to be already there doing that job in that development? So I'll stop right there and we'll continue. So, um, so I think what I, um, to answer your question, question council member, um, I'll sort of break out the two sides of section three. So section three applies to our capital fund. It also applies to our operating fund. Um, so on the capital fund side, it's, it's what I described earlier. There's a waterfall of priority. It starts with NYCHA residents who live where the work is being administered and spans out to other low income New Yorkers. Um, so in that regard, um, the sourcing would start at the development where the work is occurring, um, but it certainly can and, and does span out to other developments based on the position, the skill set requirement, um, and who's available for work. And so um, about 50% of our vendor placements are residents working either in their development or their borough. 30% are residents working in boroughs other than their own. Um, and then the other 20% are residents who are working on citywide contracts. So this could be something like layered access, where there may be one vendor for a multitude of developments. Um, notice would certainly go out to all of those developments that work is coming that way, but there may be residents from multiple NYCHA developments working at different sites. Um, and we've seen that residents are, if, if they're interested in the opportunity that they're in, and there's not a travel burden, that they will certainly move forward and, and work at those sites. On the operating side, um, we also have a, a requirement to ensure that at least 30% of our new hires are NYCHA residents. And so uh, um, on that end, we're at 38% of our new hires for 2018 were NYCHA residents. Um, the majority of our hires were in frontline positions, which is reflective of where NYCHA is hiring um, particularly now. Um, so those are like caretakers and maintenance workers and, and, and folks that you reference, but also back office and administrative staff and people in community titles as well. Um, our policy at NYCHA and, and just I'll make sure that this is correct, is um, people typically are not assigned to, if you're a NYCHA employee, that you do not work in the development that you live in. 
Um, so you may, for instance, be a housing assistant, but you're not a housing assistant where you live. And so there, you may see, for instance, at Boston Secor, NYCHA residents um, who are not from that development but were hired through that effort, but there may be Boston Secor residents who are working at a nearby development or someplace other, elsewhere in the borough. Um, I would just also add that once residents are hired, they're incumbent employees like any other employee, right? So their, their selections are based on civil service and seniority and a number of other components in terms of where, where the work is assigned. But I know that um, our HR department makes every effort to try to uh, identify um, locations that are in close proximity to where people work when making those assignments. Okay, um, I'd like to know, I know we have unions in the room, we have other rules, seniority. Um, if the goal is to make sure, and you can tell me if, my, if the goal is wrong, if the goal is to keep um, NYCHA residents close to home or close in their environment, what stops? What really stops your plan as opposed to saying this is our plan? In the scheme of everything that we have, we want to make sure that our Section 3 and our administrators, people who work there, um, again, I, I, and when I was talking about the gentleman who came from Brooklyn, he was a groundskeeper. And one of the things that I've heard from a number of residents is that groundkeepers who are not from a particular development don't have the same passion. And I'm talking about some groundkeepers who have been there and then got moved or whatever life circumstances, they're not there. But the program has not utilized people who want to work and take care of their own house. So I'm asking you all, how do we correct that? Is there a plan in place? If not, can we formulate one to make sure that we really put our best efforts to make sure that people who live in NYCHA in their own NYCHAs can stay almost like, if I'm keeping up my apartment clean, why can't I keep my outdoor grounds clean? Then I can hold people accountable because you got to see me every day. But if I got to go on a train and leave, who cares? Then you come back to work the next day and the place is tore up. Now you twist it at the people and then you're not going to do the work because I just cleaned this up. How do we change the mindset of how the system thinks about how they utilize Section G, other than quoting us numbers? Because when I look at some of the numbers, you know, Boston City Court gets one person. They've complained, complained to me. Each just they got one person. We need three people here. So who makes that determination when y'all lay out the 1,500 people? Who decided where everybody goes? And how do y'all break down the ratio? Because some developments are smaller than others. So how who figured out that this development gets one site, where this one gets two sites, this one gets four sites? Who's evaluating what's really needed at a site? And when you move and shift people around, are you putting them, are you filling spots? Bots in as quick as you move them out. You know, I, I said a lot. Uh, Gun Hill and Parkchester was one when y'all was consolidated, were merged together. And then what ended up happening is that everyone, y'all put everybody in a better development and one development fell apart. Then we got de deconsolidated. Y'all didn't give enough staff to one of the NYCHA developments, so they were still struggling. So I'm just asking who's making those kind of decisions on ratio when you hire folks and where do they go? Sure. So, so there are staffing um, plans that are created within our operations property management department um, based on a number of factors, acres, units, um, in terms of how caretakers, other frontline front staff are deployed. Um, when NYCHA residents are hired, um, they are, like any other employee, you know, uh, slotted into vacancies within the agency and there's an opportunity to pick amongst those vacancies that exist. Um, I'm sure that, you, as you're aware, uh, NYCHA recently reached agreement with uh, Local 237 around expanding hours of service. So this is not only a benefit um, to NYCHA residents in terms of their buildings being clean and, um, and, and more upkeep, but with that agreement, we'll also be hiring an additional 210 caretakers above our normal staffing levels. Um, so some of your concerns, and we can certainly look into Gun Hill and Parkchester in particular, around frontline staffing. Um, will hopefully be addressed through through that staffing up. Um, but the, the policy around um, having someone work where they live um, is, is something that is still in place. Um, we certainly understand your, your feedback um, and try to ensure that people are assigned, you know, in a reasonable travel distance from their home. Um, but that is a policy that applies to all employees. Um, I would just also add that, you know, uh, we, over 30% of our new hires were NYCHA resident employees last year, but over 22% of our workforce um, are NYCHA resident employees. And we see that those employees have an average tenure of over 16 years. So people come to the authorities, they, they may start as a caretaker, they move into other positions, move up the ranks, and make decisions about where they want to work um, based on their, their own 
their own personal choice. Mm -hmm. And so they would, like any other employee, take advantage of opportunities within the authority and make decisions about travel and, and the, the positions in particular. Okay. Um, just bef before I wrap up, um, I heard you mention that you're going to be working with other community-based organizations to help stabilize more of the services that you got to deliver and, and, and employee opportunities that you have to deliver. Is, are you thinking about training um, NYCHA residents who might want to get into administration or any, any other um, career field? So this way you create your own pool of NYCHA residents who are ready to jump into the workforce? Are you thinking of doing something like that? Sure, and so our work is really through partners like the CBOs we mentioned. And so we have partners who are providing training and administration. We partner with a number of CUNYs. Um, we have partnerships around IT, for instance. Um, so, so we do have those types of partnerships and training um, available to residents. Our goal is to identify the groups that are best in business at doing that kind of work, um, and then being able to connect residents to those those training slots. I would ask when you, as you do, the continue these partnership that. When it comes to a lot of our NYCHA residents, especially as you've heard stories, says we have talent. We're talented in NYCHA. Um, sometimes, due to economic conditions, it might be, it might be easier for me not to try to travel all the way down to Wall Street for training. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a way that you can figure out have training close to NYCHA residents. So, trying to get them to a training doesn't become an obstacle. Uh, as well. I have a couple of NYCHA residents who would love to get jobs. They come to me trying to get jobs, but every time they someone tell them to come someplace, they got to go to lower Manhattan, somewhere far off. That's just too challenging for them to get there due to their economic conditions. So maybe we might want to look to bringing the water to the people as opposed to trying to get the people to go far off and to drink the water. And my last question is, how are MWBEs um, part of your contracting process to making sure that there's fair equity in, in your contracts? And let me just say this. That has to be the last question. And I do apologize to my colleagues. I'm now going to have to put everybody on the clock. Thanks for mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn to my colleague to discuss MWBs. Um, thank you, Council Member. Uh, thank you, Council Member, for the MWBE question. So the Housing Authority is um, proud to partner um, with the city's goal of awarding 20 billion dollars to MWBE contract awards, um, the 10-year goal of 1NYC through 2025. So we partner with the city and provide them with our information regarding MWBEs. And for, if you just give me a second, sir, I'll find it. I gave you three seconds. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're going to really time me? Okay. That's Alika's job. Um, <laughs> but clearly, I messed up in the beginning. <laughs> I tell you what, Madam Chair, you can move on to the next member when you figure it out, please. Oh, you can I, answer it sometime. I, I have it. Oh, okay. So um, the, housing, the housing authority in the course of from – from fiscal year um, 2015 through fiscal year 2018, the Housing Authority has awarded almost $1.3 billion to city certified MWBEs. We're very proud of that number, and we're working hard to make sure that it keeps going up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate you. Thank you. What you were just reading from, will that be made a, um, available to the public, like just the information and numbers that we are seeing and hearing today? For, for the, for the um, MWBE MWBE, number? Section 3, plus, and will any of this be made public? Yes, the, uh, the uh, MWBE numbers are the numbers that are reported by MOX on their website. Um, the, they're numbers that are reported by them, and they total the numbers for all of the city and non-mayorals, and um, the information regarding the contracting for um, Section 3. We will certainly be providing that um, on an <coughs> ongoing basis biannually. Okay, thank you. So um, next we'll hear from Councilmember Menchaca, followed by Councilmember Adams, and then Councilmember Jonai. And um, we do have a clock. And then Hi. Traeger. Thank you. First question, 
the contracts uh, that you speak to regarding the uh, kind of MWBE, et cetera, there, there's a lot of different numbers that I need to reconcile here. I'm hearing from folks uh, in my community right now that are watching that essentially uh, you're, you're, you're essentially helping, there's about 270 residents start their own businesses, but you're not necessarily helping them get the contracts. Um, and then there's a discrepancy on, on say, the number of uh, what, what I think is a really small number of, of Section 3 residents getting directly hired by NYCHA in 2018. And then that big number you opened up your testimony with, with 15,000. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of swimming uh, 15,000 resident job placements. Uh, I'm assuming that's Section 3 relevant too. So I'm so confused about the, the different numbers and and how that works. We'll start there. Sure. So um, so the 15,000 number um, is a reflection of all of our hiring efforts, not only Section 3. And so that is Section 3 direct, Section 3 contractor hiring, Section 3 direct hiring, the Jobs Plus program, um, as well as our partnerships with other private employers that may not be uh, Section 3, subject to Section 3 requirements. And so that number is a reflection of a five-year period with all of those program outputs. Um, with respect to your question regarding um, small businesses with residents and MWBEs, um, so I think what you're referring to particularly was our business pathways programs yeah. um, right now, which are focused on the food and the childcare sector. Um, and that really came from, we issued a survey to residents in 2013 to understand what business areas they were interested mm -hmm. in exploring food. Like non-construction. Exactly. So food, well, so food, child care, personal care were the top categories. Doesn't mean that there aren't people who are interested in construction for sure. Um, but that's where we focus our efforts in partnership with SBS. Um, that is a different set of businesses than um, those that are doing business with NYCHA through uh, MWB contracting. Um, although NYCHA certainly has procured catering services through some of our, our resident-owned food businesses, it's a different market than, than they Got would it. pursue. So I only have a few seconds. I'm going to put, put three, hopefully three questions in 42 seconds. Uh, the the work that the contractors do through Section 3 require folks to sign in. Um, and what we're hearing on the ground is that people don't individually sign in, so you don't actually don't know who is working where. You just have numbers that are reported that I think are part of the compliance issue uh, and some of the big concerns that I think community is having for accountability. Um, so the recommendation would be that 10% Oh, and then on the other piece on the hires in Red Hook and Gowanus, the recommendation is that 10% of the 550 million allocated to Red Hook um, is for Section 3 business concerns. Uh, what percentage is being used by Section 3 business? Um, and and I guess this is the this is the question about how we how we can funnel very particular kind of funding that's coming through so that we can get to those goals. Um, and then the final thing that I can add really quick is clearly NYCHA is in the middle of a lot of um, uncertainty. The judges were waiting for the judge to make some determinations and your plan that actually changed union relationships and said, hey, we got the unions with us to do some really cool, interesting work. How are you preparing for that in terms of Section 3 and really all hiring whatsoever? Well, that's it for me. So, so I'll just quickly jump in. Um, so with uh, respect to signing in on work sites, um, that's something that we can make sure that our capital projects team looks into in particular. So there is a process where um, employees sign in on work sites. There's a, there's a reconciliation with certified payrolls. There's, there's an entire process that um, our capital projects team administers. I can't speak to it specifically, but we certainly can bring that back with Red Hook and Gowanus in particular in case there are concerns there. Um, in terms of, of moving forward, we are certainly um, you know, working to ensure that hiring is a part of any new investment that comes to the authority. Um, that is a priority, and so that, that will continue. Um, and I, th I think there was... Well, the, and then there was the recommendations on, on percentages, that you can kind of put goals around that investment. And then the last one was just the impending judge uh, decision and how, how your team is kind of thinking about that, anticipating that, and planning for that. Sure. So with the uh, Section 3 business concern, uh, I can turn to my colleague on that. But just in terms of as we, we look forward, we are, um, you know, awa awaiting uh, and, and certainly working through the, the change underway. Um, and 
resident hiring is still a priority within that. Um, and obviously we work through community-based partners who are anchors in there in the neighborhoods we serve. And so we fully anticipate that residents would still have those connections. Good afternoon. Um, with respect to Section 3 business concerns, we've worked really hard uh, to try to increase the number of Section 3 business concerns that are on the NYCHA registry. Um, we, we identified a small segment of Section 3 business concerns that are actually owned and operated um, by NYCHA residents, and we work hard. Um, I work with, with a Section 3 business concerns to make sure that they are included in all MWBE outreach programs and initiatives. If they want to help build their business, we connect them with SBS, which can help them build their business um, and, and do work not only for NYCHA, but for all other city agencies as well, which might have you know smaller, smaller um, projects that they are actually um, more inclined to uh, get bid awards for. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you both for your testimony today. We really appreciate it. I guess I'm I'm having a, a little bit of a hard time with a lot of the numbers that we've been listening to uh, this afternoon, and I'm listening to my colleagues struggle with the numbers as well. Um, one of the most difficult ones for me to hear about was the five-year time frame um, as far as employment is concerned, and we're sitting here going, we could go to med school. Um, so th that's one thing. The other thing uh, that, that um, my colleagues spoke about were these numbers. Uh, as they pertain to overall hires in 2018, for me and my three developments um, in Southeast Queens, Baisley Park, South Jamaica 1, and South Jamaica 2, I've got one person at each development for the entire year of 2018, and that disturbs me. Um, and I know that if it disturbs me, it certainly disturbs the residents of these developments. So m my question, and just trying to assess uh, who the hires are. Is there any breakdown? We had an individual testify earlier. Um, it, according to, uh, he expressed his concern, uh, white collar jobs uh, and blue collar jobs. What is the breakdown um, of these types of jobs in Section 3 hires? Um, and I just need to, that's my first question. Uh, and and my, my other question, if we can just get a little bit more specific as to where these numbers, how these numbers are assessed specifically for individual developments when we know that there are thousands of residents in New York City NYCHA developments. And to see numbers one, two, and three consistent on these pages, it's very disturbing to me. So if you can just help me to understand that a little bit more and then give us a little assessment as far as the types of jobs we're talking about with the new hires. Thank you. So on the operating side, um, so those direct hires with the authority, um, the majority of those positions are caretaker positions. Um, there are also administrative titles, um, customer service inf information uh, titles, and other positions throughout the authority, but the bulk of the hiring is within our frontline caretaker position, which is the bulk of where NYCHA is hiring. Um, on the vendor side, um, particularly on capital contracts, the top titles are mason tenders, asbestos handlers, laborers. Um, there are any energy conservation assistants, um, security guards, carpenters. There are a number of titles, um, but the titles and the jobs really reflect the work that um, we are awarding as well as where our hiring efforts are focused right now, um, which is primarily frontline hiring as well as construction and repair work. Okay, um, that summed up a lot. Um, thank you, Clock. Um, <laughs> just, to, just to add, you know, and, and thank you for your responses. It's, it's just a little disturbing. No, it's a lot disturbing um, to hear that there are so many residents that are asking all of us um, and looking at us, you know, like please help us to do our jobs better and get employment and get good career pathing for residents as one of one of the folks testified here today. I mean, we're talking about people um, living in NYCHA who have multiple degrees in some in some places, and we are not servicing them the way that we know that the city can service them, um, especially with the with the 
m mountainous uh, number of issues that are that's going on with NYCHA right now. I think that we can do a better job with Section 3. So I'm sure that the co-chairs today are taking all of this in, and um, we are going to carefully look at this and see how we can best assist uh, NYCHA with getting Section 3 a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you. Before you, um, you ask your question, Councilmember Joe and I, what would be helpful is to paint us a quick picture. And I'm just going back off of what Councilmember Adams just talked about. We see the num we've heard a lot of numbers, mm -hmm. and we see the numbers, you know, next to the one, 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 one. And in your testimony, it says, we also incorporate resident hiring requirements for other real estate development activities, energy contracts, and more. So, and then you mentioned that you were at 38% um, of hiring the new hirees. So can you give us an example of a development that you're working in now, new contract, looking at the 30% new hiree requirement, and just um, give us an example of how you arrived at that 38%. Like, you know, give us the development, how many people are hired that are working there, and, and, and just what that looks like so that we can see a picture of it. I think that would be helpful. Sure, so the 38% um, reference was re in reference to the hires directly with the authority. And so 38% of the new hires with NYCHA itself. Okay, so, all right, so let's, so we're not talking about NYCHA then. Okay, so, so now we know what that 38% was because there was a question. So give it, paint us a picture of a new contract that you have where they have hired a certain amount of residents in that particular development under that contract and you're proud of and everything that you said today would back up what is actually happening on the ground right now. Sure, so um, I mean, there, I can't think of a specific contract in this instance. Um, I, I do have the hiring information for Smith, which was a question, and so I can speak to that if okay. that's helpful. Okay. Um, Even though that, that was Sandy, right? That's Sandy, okay. but okay. It, it's, okay. it's still a, we are applying a Section 3 in that instance. Um, so with that contract in particular, there were 13 new hires, and all 13 of those hires are Section 3 hires. Um, two of the Section 3 hires reside at Smith. Um, at Smith, there were seven residents trained through the Sandy P. Apprentice Program, and so um, I don't have the placement information for those other, the, the balance of the seven, um, but they could be at other NYCHA developments, for instance. Um, and so the, the process is when NYCHA awards a contract, there is a hiring projection. Um, there is a pre-start meeting with the tenant association um, where there's a review of what that projection is. There is an re ongoing referral process throughout the life of the contract. A contract could go multiple years. Um, and throughout that process, NYCHA would help the vendor um, obtain and source candidates. Um, at the close of the contract, NYCHA would evaluate whether um, the vendor itself um, is compliant with its requirements. Um, another example that I can certainly share, um, which was reflected in the, the panel prior to us, um, is Ocean Bay. Um, that is where we had a RAD preservation project. Um, the building was converted from Section 9 to Section 8. Um, as part of that project, there were um, two key hiring components. Um, the, the, the developer um, had a hiring requirement around their construction jobs, which was per the regulation. NYCHA additionally added a hiring requirement with respect to their permanent jobs, um, which didn't extend per the regulation, but NYCHA extended it in that instance. Um, and then there was also Sandy work occurring there, so there were additional hires through FEMA funding. Um, across that project, there were over se almost 70 hires between the permanent jobs and the construction jobs within Ocean Bay. Um, and many of those residents are still working today, including the gentleman who tested this morning um, and so there's certainly um, the, the the extent of the regulation is 30% of new hires we make every effort to push beyond that um, and Ocean Bay is certainly an example of that or our Sandy program is an example of that where we're applying section 3 where the extent of the regulation does not exist um, but our efforts outside of section 3 also reflect that and so NYCHA residents 
our New Yorkers. They're con they, you know, our goal is also to make sure that they're connected to the city systems that provide workforce services. And so this goes beyond Reese. It goes beyond Section Three. It includes the programs that we're initiating with our partners. It includes connections to the workforce system um, and other programs that can help them with their their aspirations, whatever it may be. Um, the hiring that NYCHA generates typically is really primarily reflective of what you would see with a landlord. A lot of um, maintenance positions, building management positions, construction positions, and we know that there are certainly careers beyond that. And that's the reason why, um, although we want to make sure we're maximizing Section 3, we are still focused on having community partnerships where people can access training and opportunities in sectors where NYCHA is typically not generating vacancies. Okay, and so what's in front of us is the direct NYCHA hiring, so, so this is solely Yes, and folks I, that are working at NYCHA. At NYCHA today. And so can we get a list of the Section 3 hirees the same, like within the same type of um, format for the other jobs? The vendor, yeah. in the and so what is being prepared for, for you, and I apologize that we don't have that today, but what is being prepared for you is an exact map for your, your respective areas with the vendor hires. All right, thank you, Council Member Jonah. Thank you, Chairs. Will those vendor hires also include titles, salaries, positions? Sure, There's we can there. share with you, um, and we can also give like the top 20 titles, average wage as well, just so you have a sense of what the typical titles are. Great. Are you familiar with Throgs Neck Housing in the Bronx? Yes. Okay, during the summer, there was some very questionable eye rise, raising, eyebrow raising uh, conduct uh, that forced NYCHA to relocate, I believe it was more than 40 employees to other NYCHA facilities. Correct? To my understanding, yes. Okay. So those 40, which the investigation is still go ongoing, have not been relocated back to their original positions in that facility. They're scattered throughout the five boroughs. Of those 40 replacements that came in, how many of them are Section 3 candidates. According to the figure you just gave me as permanent hires, you have two. Just And I would consider them to be new hires, uh, or somewhere in the system there should be a new hire to replace the transaction. If it's 40 employees, 30%, that would mean it should be a number of 12. So I, I can't speak to that, unfortunately, um, but my colleague, uh, Kerry Jew, is, is joining us. Thank you. So so that's another point, and I'm sorry um, for not mentioning that. Just for clarification on this map, this is showing you the number of residents who live at Throgs Neck who've been hired by NYCHA. It does not necessarily mean that they're working at Throgs Neck or even working in the capacity of a caretaker. It's, it's a demonstration of who was hired by NYCHA from the developments where so this is not demonstrating where they're working, it's where what NYCHA facility they're coming from. So in the city, I have two from Throgs Neck Housing throughout the city of New York in all NYCHA that were, facilities? That were employed last year. Um, so you may have employees from Throgs Neck Houses who were employed years prior who are still part of NYCHA's workforce. But in, with respect to who we hired last year, Two of those residents were from Throgs Neck. Now I'm completely confused. The number that you provided was 15,000. Total employees that were hired by NYCHA since 2014. Am I correct on that? So, and I'm sorry for, for this confusion. So um, the number that we shared uh, reflects all of NYCHA's resident employment efforts hires through our partners, through Section 3, direct hires, key programs like the Jobs Plus program, a variety of services that have been ser serving NYCHA residents. This map here is only a reflection within the last year of, of all the employees that NYCHA hired who came from your respective districts. And so th those two individuals were hired last year. If you're giving us a bird's eye view of 2014 through 2018 by giving us numbers of 15,000, why wouldn't you give us the entire number for that same period regardless and only give us a 2018 snapshot? So of new hires, of direct hires from your development? The, you, let's go back to the 15,000 number. That is a 2000, from 2014 through 2018 figure. Am I correct? Yes. Yet the numbers that you've just given us 
are specifically for 2018 only. Mm -hmm. We're missing 14 through 17 to get a complete reflection of the number of Section 8 positions that were afforded of the 15,000. Sure. So we can certainly share with you direct hires over that period. But isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? If you're giving us so numbers and it looks great, 15,000 employees from New York City hired permanent jobs, and then you only give us a snapshot of one year where that captures four, five. So we can certainly follow up with you, council member. I'm, I, my last question, I'm sorry for going a bit chair with your permission. The um, question on S3BC, where the threshold allows for either 51% of the company has to be owned by a section three um, individual, or 30% staffed by section three, or at a minimum, 25% of the total uh, award to go to a S3BC contractor. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. How does that conflict with our current WMBE program of 30%? Um, so, se the Section 3 program is race and gender neutral, and it's a um, HUD federal mandate. The MWBE program that the city and state run, um, the Housing Authority is a non-mayoral agency. So we, um, we, although we're a part of one NYC, and we certainly work hard um, to develop MW, MWBE contract awards, um, we are not part of the 30% goal for MWBE contract awards that other mayoral agencies are a part of. So in addition to the 30% uh, goal for WMBEs, we have an additional, um, I'm guessing that is 30% as well, uh, that fall under S3BC? So the section three. Or are we double dipping there, saying if they're minority owned, we're going to claim that they're meeting our quota or our goal under uh, S3BC? So we don't. A, a Section 3 business concern. Um, it's The Section 3 program is race and gender neutral, um, so it is different from the MWBE program that's run by the city. Um, the Section 3 program is mandated by HUD. The Housing Authority is funded by HUD, so we are obligated to follow the mandates of Section 3. Um, the city and the state's MWBE program, their disparity studies, while the Housing Authority works hard to ensure that MWBE um, contract awards happen, um, we are not part of Local Law 1. Um, we we um, certainly, our contract awards to MWBEs are counted, and that $1.3 billion that was awarded over the last four fiscal years are numbers for city-certified MWBEs that we reported um, to MOX. But that is um, separate, um, sir, from the Section 3 goals required uh, by HUD. My last question. Is it possible that some of the S3BC entities are also registered WMBEs? It, it is certainly possible if you are a Section 3 business concern um, that you could also be um, a minority women-owned business that is city certified. That is certainly possible. Thank you for your time. I'd like to continue this conversation off in the future. Uh, there's many more questions that have gone um, unanswered and because of time constraints. Thank you for your consideration, Chair. Councilmember Traeger. Thank you to both chairs for holding this very timely hearing. I'm just going to uh, quickly put my teacher hat on and, you know, we used to divide up the positives and then areas for, for improvement. So the positives. Uh, so when I took office, uh, and I was in my previous role, the chair of the Recovery Resiliency Committee, I made it a priority in my district to hold a meeting with all my NYCHA leaders and NYCHA uh, to meet every three to four months to discuss Hurricane Sandy recovery work um, and to make sure the residents were updated about the recovery efforts and to also make sure that as we advance in the recovery that residents don't just witness the recovery but they have opportunities to be uh, active participants in the recovery working on their job sites. 
So NYCHA did attend those meetings, and I greatly appreciate that, and, and so I will give NYCHA a, a check mark for that. But here's where I am very concerned and, quite frankly, angry. Uh, I don't believe NYCHA did any prep work in advance of the PLA agreement being signed with labor. Now, I come from labor, so I appreciate the role that labor plays in New York City and our country. But the residents of my developments and of the Rockaways and Red Hook, Canarsie, you name all the areas that were impacted by Sandy, they were the ones advocating for the FEMA money. They were the ones fighting for it. This council held hearings to make sure that FEMA delivered on that money. The administration signed the PLA without really checking or speaking with us, certainly did not tell the residents. And now you have a PLA. Uh, and many of the residents are very frustrated, understandably so, and angry that they've been effectively shut out. And it's my understanding that Reese is supposed to keep track of those residents who have signed up looking for work and, and to kind of see where they're at, uh, if they need to build up their capacity. So we have this information, this pool of data about residents seeking work. You have FEMA, and I don't know the next time FEMA will, will deliver a $3 billion check to anyone, let alone the Housing Authority. And our residents are not going to be the ones really, for the most part, working on these drop sites. Now, I understand that you, you're going to point to numbers where they, they went to workshops, they went to trainings. But in my meetings and in my research in my district, some of our folks are, might be lacking in a, in a couple of air, key areas. But if we knew they were lacking in key areas, we knew that the, the, the press conference for the FEMA check was years ago. Work did not start until re really about a year, year and a half ago in old developments. We had time to build up capacity. We had time to bring in labor, to bring in NYCHA, to bring the administration and residents together to say, what can we do to cut the red tape, to cut any communication gap and get residents onto the job site? And we failed. We failed. And I am hearing that you know, PLA is being negotiated again. We have to have residents at the table. We have to. And I respect my sisters and brothers from labor. And I'm sure that they want to open their doors to have more residents entering their, their, their workforce. But residents were, sh in my view, they were shut out. And I was at the grassroots in here having meetings every three months in my district about Hurricane Sandy recovery efforts. And here we are advocating for more money for NYCHA, and NYCHA definitely needs it. There's no question about it. But we also need to make sure that we're building up capacity in our, in, in our residential buildings as well. In my district, I worked with Workforce One on a, uh, because their data showed me, I didn't really hear from Reese, I heard from Workforce One. We're lucky we have one in Coney Island. They told me that some residents coming in are lacking, for example, high school diploma. So I am funding a free high school equivalency class in my district with, with food, with childcare, with case management, with social workers. It's, it's a whole wraparound service program because we're going to get those folks hooked up to jobs. But I didn't get that much help from Reese or much help from, from folks fr from, from the other, other agencies. I did this organically on my own with, with, within our own structures. So I would just urge you, this is more of, a, of, a, of, a, of an urge, urge appeal, that we need to do more to build up capacity. We need to also understand that NYCHA has the, has the leverage power. Before we sign agreements, we need to make sure residents are at the table and they and their priorities are also heard. And if you could speak to that, I, I would greatly appreciate that. And, and I look forward to making sure that we, we don't make this error again. We need to make sure residents are at the table and that everyone understands that residents entering the workforce has to be a priority before anything is signed, especially a $3 billion check. I, I'd be happy to hear, hear your commentary. Thank you. Thank you um, for your comments, Council Member. Um, so with respect to uh, the recovery neighborhoods in particular, um, as you are aware, um, when NYCHA received the, the funding from FEMA, it took an additional measure, which was really to create a Section 3 program specific to um, the standard recovery effort. And so I know that you regularly engage with that team. Um, and so there's certainly the citywide services that are available to, to Reese, but for residents who live in the Hurricane Sandy impacted areas, they have this additional Sandy recovery 
recovery program with the team who's on the ground on a regular basis. Um, across the Sandy portfolio, there have been around 1,000 hires and around 700 of those hires are Section 3 individuals. Um, but the challenge that you described on the ground is I don't disagree. Um, and we know that that's a challenge across our portfolio. Um, as I mentioned, we are entering renegotiation uh, regarding the PLA. Resident hiring is at the, the crux of that and at the forefront of it. Um, we, when we entered the PLA, we had an additional MOU specifically focused on resident training um, because we knew that there, were, there would be uh, challenges to entering into particular trades. And so that's where we are focusing our attention, not only in ensuring that people have access to the union, but that the unions are partners with us in preparing people. Um, um, so I, we certainly would look to engage with you. Um, I know our team, uh, NYCHA team, regularly partic participates in the, the breakfasts um, that you host, and so we would look to, to continue to do that and get that feedback as we start those discussions. Yes, in closing, I thank the chair so much for, for being very patient with me. This is my closing statement. Yes, NYCHA attends the breakfast, and I do appreciate that, and, and I, that's, that's a big part. It's a big part of our communication. But what I would urge the administration, urge NYCHA, and also the mayor's office on this, is that before anything is signed, check in and consult. Because quite frankly, and I'm, I'm very blunt, and I'm not faulting you in particular because I know you weren't the one that signed anything. But it was a real slap in the face to residents who really worked so hard for years. And they were the ones subjected to no heat, no hot water during those uh, days right after Sandy. They were the ones that organized. They were the ones that came to hearings and testified. Not to even tell them or to tell us that that was being signed or even negotiated. And again, we want labor, of course, there. We want labor at the table. But the residents have to be there, too. So my appeal to the administration is to make sure that residents are at the front and center of these discussions and negotiations. Yes, we want quality work, but there is something called human resilience, as opposed, in addition to physical resiliency. We have an obligation to build up human capacity in our developments. So for anything is signed, for anything is dotted, let's make sure residents are at the table and their needs and their, and their concerns are front and center. And I thank the chair for her time. Thank you so much, uh, Councilman Traeger, for, for um, sharing your experiences, your, your real-time experiences. Obviously, for the past five years, I've witnessed you uh, advocate on behalf of those residents in the Coney Island area and resiliency and, and, and so forth. And he makes a really great point uh, that we want to make sure that whatever we do moving forward as a result of this hearing and the information that we ascertain that it reflects the needs and the values of, of the NYCHA residents that we all represent here. So I want to digress a little bit and, and go back to the nearly 550 residents that were hired internally um, by NYCHA in 2018. Is that correct? Because there's so many numbers flying around here. It was somewhere 548, 549 uh, Five, throughout the boroughs. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the total number of internal hires uh, for NYCHA in 2018? That, that only reflects 38% of the new hires. of. 30, so that's 38, that's nearly, well, close to half of the new hires throughout the entire NYCHA system, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, by virtue of, of, of attrition and all the other things that we only hired 550 folk. 550 NYCHA residents. NYCHA residents, yeah. Out of the Maybe other... Maybe 1,100 14, that were hired. The, the balance, so the total... So there were four, over 1,400 uh, hires by the authority last year, um, and 38 percent, or 550, were NYCHA residents. Okay. So as we um, and and we'd like to see again in, in our follow-up letter that goes to you that that um, specifics on on where those hirees came from sure. uh, within uh, the department and agencies. Um, does that include recent, uh, as was testified earlier, the Ocean Bay hires? So um, the, the gentleman uh, who spoke earlier was hired by Wavecrest, um, who was the new landlord at Ocean Bay. And so that would reflect a Section 3 hire with one of our vendors. 
Um, so they are employees of the Ocean Bay. They manage the property. Um, they have full-time jobs. Um, but those are not NYCHA employees because there is now a private landlord um, who's operating. Do you know how many of those current employees uh, were NYCHA employees prior to the transition? So the, the new hires, um, uh, 30, I can get the exact number, but over 30 new hires were um, of NYCHA residents who were not NYCHA resident employees, NYCHA residents who were hired by the new landlord there for their day-to-day -day duties. Um, incumbent NYCHA employees were, um, had the opportunity to move to other positions within the agency. Do you know how many NYCHA employees are there now? So within Ocean Bay, there are no NYCHA employees anymore um, at that site because we've converted it through our rental assistance demonstration program to um, a partnership-based model where there, there's Section 8. But there was an opportunity for them to stay somewhere where they may have been working for 5, 10, 20 years, right? So I, I'll let my colleague Carrie speak to the incumbent workers who were at Ocean Bay. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the employees who were assigned to Ocean Bay prior to the transition to Wavecrest were given the opportunity to take jobs with Wave Wavecrest if that's what they chose, <coughs> or they were given the opportunity to be redeployed into existing vacancies within NYCHA. Everybody chose to be redeployed to existing vacancies within NYCHA. How, how, how many residents, uh, how many employees, how many people were employed at, at the Ocean Bay or whatever it was called back then? I, I, don't, I don't have that number. I will have to get back to But the to retention you. is zero? The retention for NYCHA was 100%. They all stayed working for NYCHA. The retention for people that stayed working at that uh, facility was zero? The Did anybody, is anybody currently still working there? No, as as uh, my colleague. Why is that? It that is a development that is now privately. Why owned. why is there zero retention? Why would someone leave somewhere that they've been working for five, okay. ten, or twenty years? So, so I can just speak to that. Um, so when we when we have transitioned program uh, developments into our our RAD program, um, we literally turn the key and there's a private landlord who now manages the day-to-day -day operations of the building. So the incumbent NYCHA workers are able to move elsewhere in our portfolio and then at Ocean Bay we've hired over 30 residents who live in that development who now manage the building. If I'm working somewhere, if I'm invested somewhere for 5, 10, 15, 20 years or one year and someone else comes in and takes over why would 100 percent of that population leave there has to be some investment in 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 the development as as such so i i don't like to to assume assume what individuals May, what what factors into an individual's decision about their employment? I, I don't think that any of us can decide for another person what's best for them in terms of their employment um, and who they're employed by. The the people, the NYCHA employees who were impacted by the transition at Ocean Bay um, perhaps did not want to take the position at that location because they would be represented by a different union. Perhaps they did not want to take that position because they would no longer be city employees and they have vested interests in retaining their city employment, retaining pensions that they had already contributed to that perhaps they were not yet vested in or coming close to being vested in. Um, perhaps the benefit packages were not as attractive to them for whatever reason. But I, I can't judge for any individual. Um, I don't think any of us could very fairly judge for any other individual what a, a better or worse benefit package or work environment is or employer is because it's really an individual decision upon uh, based upon your okay. personal life circumstances. Thank you. I, I think that's a bit disingenuous, but but... It is what it is. Um, how many employees, can you tell me how many employees uh, were, were residents, NYCHA residents, prior to the transition? 
I would have to get back to you on, on how many employees were NYCHA residents working at Ocean Bay. So we're not including Ocean Bay in any of our figures or that, that you've delivered to us today, or, or are they included in vendor at, at, as, as, as vendors? So, so as a vendor? Um, yeah, so we're including their employment numbers as a vendor. Is so, 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 so Wavecrest would be um, a private employer. Um, and so of their, so 37 NYCHA residents work with Wavecrest th through that transaction who were residents of that development. Um, there may be other NYCHA residents who are NYCHA employees who've okay. worked all throughout the Rockaways, um, and we can certainly share with you how many worked in Ocean Bay. So... As it, uh, I know that we have PLAs, and do, do we also have prevailing wage agreements with with uh, with our vendors? Yes. Yeah, so um, it's based on our federal funding. We have prevailing wage requirements as well. And and uh, those current employees are they a part of that prevailing wage program, or is there an individual number that was negotiated? Are they represented by a union? Could you answer that, or do we need to call them back up here? So they, they, the, the people who are currently employed by Wavecrest at Ocean Bay, I believe that they are represented by a union, but they are not represented by Local 237, which was basically the union that represented most of the employees who were at Ocean Bay when NYCHA ran Ocean Bay. Okay, so, but they, they, they are, a, a, they would be a part of the uh, federal prevailing wage mandate, correct? I, I don't know. We, we'd have to get back to you on that. Okay, so you know what, perhaps then we, if they're still here, we can call them up and let them speak for themselves. Uh, Chair Samuels has a question. You know, um, so we, we are going to ask you that question, so just give us one second. But I, I want to just kind of piggyback a little bit. Um, you mentioned 22% of the NYCHA workforce are residents. And I know that we have been um, looking at Ocean Bay and um, there's just been some other deals, even the Triborough deals um, where uh, NYCHA residents who were members of Local 237 decided to not continue on with that development and that new management company, that private management company, and they continued on with NYCHA and went to a different development. Understand that. But as we are looking towards the future, and this is what, we were, what we've been talking about, and we're looking at some 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 um, units of converging, um, conversions into Section 8, understanding that the, um, the precedent that has been set is that if you are a 237 member, you go for a, you know, you have the opportunity to just continue working at NYCHA at a different development. But what's the reality of if we look in at that converting of 50,000 plus units of the local 237 workforce actually having continued employment at NYCHA? So my understanding, first of all, that that's over a very long period of time. Um, and my understanding is that there wouldn't be anybody who would not be able to continue their employment with NYCHA. Okay. And so have you had any conversations at all within the, the um, deal structure to be able to continue with um, the local 237 workforce at the new um, converted developments and not necessarily have the management company come in and um, have their own um, maintenance workers and caretakers where there's an opportunity to continue with a deal with Local 237? I, I don't think we could be part of that because it, it's an agreement between a company and, and a union that we're not a party the to. The reason why I ask that question is because we all took a trip to Cambridge Public Housing Authority um, Cambridge Housing Authority, and we see where the Teamsters local on the ground there is the same, and, and in fact, it was Local 237 that we went with, and um, Cambridge Housing Authority was able to, um, with their conversions, continue with the um, management and maintenance of those particular developments, and so the Teamsters are still working in the now RAD converted developments, and so I'm asking if there's an opportunity 
there to be able to do the same thing that some other housing authorities are doing around the country. I think that we're continually looking at how these deals are structured in other places and if there are any best practices that we could adopt, then certainly I don't think that anybody is saying that we are, our door is shut to look. But you haven't had those conversations with the upcoming? Uh, I personally have not had those conversations, but um, I do know that um, that our general manager and Local 237 went to Cambridge as well on a visit um, and have had discussions about best practices. Okay. I, I, I think that I, I would hope that the information that we asked for without bringing anybody else up and, and, and continuing this, that we could obtain that information as we move forward. I know that um, during the uh, introduction of the RADs that we, uh, the, the uh, Committee on Civil Service and Labor was to uh, hold a hearing specifically on that, and that has not happened. I know that there was some resistance to have that conversation, publicly have that conversation, and, and it's something that we need to talk about, because what we're talking about here is creating opportunity, real career opportunities, real middle class opportunities. Um, and, and these are folks and residents that have given back um, to the city of New York over, over a number of years and, and really demonstrated the value of the services that they have delivered. And, and I think that we owe them a greater responsibility in the kick them the curb in the manner that we have done and that, that you can kind of move on. And for a lot of reasons there are, and we understand that just based on the agreement that was done that opened up the scope of work being done by Local 237 and others outside the non-traditional hours, um, it's important that you have residents and, and um, who are familiar with, with the, uh, with the um, facilities, but also um, live within the proximity so that they can meet the new mandate, right? And, and that is something that, that was asked and quite frankly, it was years coming and years in negotiation um, in order for that to happen. But at the same time, if we demonstrate such value in the need for that work being done, then we should be able to transform that into whatever project that we have moving forward. If not that, the same level of compensation should be able to be delivered on behalf of those workers. And as this is, uh, uh, the Civil Service and Labor Committee, and that is a big part of what we do, understanding that there should not be a diminishing of compensation when there is no diminishing of services, right? We, we, we can't ask people to do the same job for less. And, and uh, for um, a municipality that I think that has been at the forefront in demonstrating that we value our workforce, that our workforce is the reason why 62,000 tourists come to New York City last year and why businesses such as Amazon decide that they want to relocate because we have great public safety. Um, we have great transportation irregardless. We have housing, we have great libraries and great education because of the public services and the municipal services, and more importantly, that was municipal workforce, it gives us value. So we should not diminish that value of who we are by diminishing those workers and how we compensate them. And that is certainly a compensation that we need to have. Now, I'm going to conclude with, um, has NYCHA, anyone in the NYCHA universe had was they a part of any of the uh, Amazon negotiations and and if so could you elaborate where uh, permissible and or what would be what do you anticipate the impact of Amazon being on the residents of uh, Woodside houses uh, Queensbridge Astoria and Ravenswood so I, NYCHA was not part of those negotiations, so 
I can't speak to that. Um, with Great. respect to um, uh, services for residents in those areas. I know those discussions are ongoing and there certainly um, is an expansion of the Jobs Plus program, but there, this is the beginning of the process. And, 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 and do you care to elaborate at, at all on, uh, on, on the furtherance of the RADS program or any negotiation around compensation? Um, is there any agreement in NYCHA that there has to be a certain level of compensation maintained? Uh, in order for uh, a, 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 a developer to come in and assume responsibilities for um, those residencies? So I'm personally am not responsible or part of structuring the, the deals. I know that um, development partners come in with, with deals and we're certainly looking for good jobs and good wages. Um, we can get back to you on the, on the specifics of what's being asked of them. So, so um, has NYCHA, NYCHA leadership demanded a, a seat at the table uh, uh, in, in terms of being that voice for NYCHA residents um, in, the, in, the, in the Amazon deal moving forward? So Certainly I, there's I, a space. I would think that if it hasn't happened, somebody dropped the ball. So, um, so I, I can't speak to um, what discussions are happening uh, amongst our leadership. I but, think someone can. But okay, but sure. So, yeah. So I mean, the the negotiations are ongoing. I know that there um, is certainly uh, engagement happening with the residents. I would say, from our perspective, we're we're listen, eager to hear what residents are saying, um, and certainly continuing. So, to there's engagements happening with the residents between like the residents and the administration in Amazon, or so, just like some random. So, so, the residents. so I know that there um, is a community advisory process that's being established and that um, residents, associations in particular, um, will have a, a role in that process. And so with respect to that, right, we're, we're looking to hear what they are saying and what's coming out from those discussions. Okay. That's, that's just always unfortunate. And I say that because in every single hearing that I've had over the past year, it's a constant, um, you know, residents at the table and, and there being the direct connection between resident leaders or um, resident leaders and the executive um, uh, members at NYCHA at 250 Broadway, just so, you know, the right hand can know what the left hand is doing. And um, we know that uh, you know, folks are actually involved. And if we have a mayor and an administration that at every given moment when the conversation about the Amazon deal is mentioned, mm -hmm. the next thing they say is all the work that they're going to be doing in partnership with the residents of NYCHA and the surrounding area. And so to be able to hear that um, the that there's no clear-cut understanding as to what that means, what that looks like, is very, very, very unfortunate because, you know, at the end of it all, it looks like we'll just be, you know, the residents, you know, will just not really be able to benefit the way they could if there was intentional discussions and intentional strategic efforts uh, made on behalf of the residents in the, in the way that that is known and transparent. And, um, and so that's, it, it always boils down to transparency and, and um, you know, folks just not knowing. And the purpose of I, I say it, I said in the beginning, our role is um, is to advocate on behalf of our constituents. You know, they elected us to office to to do just this. And um, over and over again, I, I feel like a broken record. I constantly say, you know, wh where's the the residents at the table in a in a meaningful, mm -hmm. constructive, organized way. And so with that. Um, I just said transparency. I have one last question, uh, and it's related to just your data, database and um, like your online website. Um, in your testimony, it says, in addition, we will publish re a report on Section 3 compliance for closed contracts twice per year on our website in furtherance of our transparency efforts. And then it says, we're also implementing new tracking measures and developing updated procedures and training for staff. So I just wanted to get a sense of what, are we, what, are, what will we see with these new, um, this new report that's going to be published online for transparency in this new database, this new tracking um, system. Uh, like, what's your goal with this? What, you know, what, how will this 
change anything or you know make residents comfortable in 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 the process and and what you're doing so you know like just just what's your goal and, and what will we see in the next coming months and exactly when will we see it Sure. So, um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague Esther to just give a sense of what that compliance reporting looks like. Um, but the goal is to make sure that residents understand, um, and the public also understands for respective contracts what are the new hires out of all new hires and, and where they sit with respect to compliance. I also just want to quickly um, circle back on the the previous discussion regarding Amazon because I also want to make sure that. I, you know, I, I represent one part of the agency and certainly not the entire agency. So I don't want to misspeak in terms of NYCHA's role in, in discuss, discussions or interagency convening. We certainly can follow up with you after the hearing with more details. Um, I, so that doesn't necessarily cover the folks who are at the table today. And uh, with that being said, I, I actually want your role to be one of the main roles mm -hmm. at NYCHA. Mm -hmm. Because you are, you know, the executive vice president of community engagement and partnerships. So everything that we're talking about as it relates to the residents is about engagement, how we engage in the residents. When it talks about partnerships, you know, who are we partnering with? And if you're doing that, be able to provide us with that information so that the residents can know what's actually happening. So, you know, I understand it's a is a 11,000, you know, member organization agency. Um, but I think the most important piece of it is residents. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that your role at, in any meeting, you should be sitting right next to um, Stan Bresenhoff and, 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 and Vito Masachulo at every given moment, because to me that actually transcribes into what the residents are able to see and do and feel and hear and, and their voice. So um, continue. Thank you. Um, and so I will ask Esther um, to speak to the compliance reporting. Excuse me. So our, the goal is to provide a biannual report on um, the information that we've provided today for um, for the annual period to provide this on a biannual method so that everyone is aware of how many um, contract awards were tracked and how many Section 3 residents were hired and out of those Section 3 residents, how many were in fact NYCHA residents for purposes of transparency and informational. It, it, and will this be consistent with the recommendations made by the New York City Comptroller? There were many, there were numerous recommendations that were made because he found um, compliance monitoring to be severely deficient in his audit. Uh, so w w do what we expect to see. Will we expect to see some of the recommendations made by the Comptroller's office or will we maintain that we were and compliance. So I can jump in here um, and, and speak to that. Um, so that audit, I believe, was 2012 or 2013. 14, 14 sorry. Um, okay. Um, 2014. Um, and one of the key recommendations um, among the, amongst the finding was really around the, the process for tracking hiring through the hiring summaries. Um, and so one of the efforts that NYCHA put in place, which is reflected in the unit um, that Esther now manages, is having that centralized system. Private, previously, NYCHA did not have that. Um, and so that was one of the, the, I would say, out of all the recommendations, certainly the key one, um, so that there's a central repository of that information, and there's a team that is focused on compliance tracking. So, so I gather this is what we can expect to see, and we look forward to it. And um, from 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 the labor perspective, um, there are a number of follow-ups that we want to send to you guys and, and hopefully um, have a respond fairly quickly because we want to move forward. And, and a lot of it has to do with the PLAs and we want to make sure that we're able to weigh in as much as possible. In particular, we want to uh, continue to look at expanding the scope of, of, of the painting program and some of the work they were doing around mold mitigation, uh, glazing, and, and the rest of the stuff that needs to be done and where there is an opportunity for the council to continue to be supportive. Certainly we want to do that, but we want to make sure that there is uh, that level of transparency and making sure that we are getting the bang for our buck and that, we, you know, that, um, that the intentions are, are really being followed through. Uh, so we're going to send you that. and. Um, 
personally thank you all for it's been very long that you guys have been up there and but I'm sure you're used to it and uh, for the public and the residents uh, it's been it's it's been uh, really necessary that we have this and as we talk about um, job creation that we, we, we really need to look at home and, and make sure that we're creating work and responsible uh, job opportunities right here at home and uh, and 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 if we didn't, we'd, we'd really be remiss if that we allowed companies to continue to come from uh, around the state and out of state, employing their own workforce and doing work when we really have competent workers right here in the city, and whatever that we, we can do to to improve workforce development around the specific needs of nature. Um, Obviously, that's something that we need to focus in on as well, and that we'll um, share that information as well. So, thank you, okay. uh, Ms. Hines. Do do you the executive compliance department? Does that fall under your shop? Does that still exist, or is that like a separate department? So I'm responsible. I work under the supply management procurement department. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, we, we, it's vendor integrity and, um, and supplier diversity. Um, that's different than the housing authorities, um, EVP for compliance, which is a different, a different department. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, there's a lot that was said today and I, um, do appreciate you. Um, being able to come in and um, have a discussion and there's a ton of follow-up yeah. so I look forward to the follow-up okay. thank, you. thank you thank you and so next we'll hear from John Allen Ocean Bay Ambrosio Polino Mara Cerizo and William Gregory. So that's Ocean Bay and Green City Forest. No, we're there. The people who were on the panel. And can we add a chair? Because I didn't, you walked out, Ms. Forbes. I didn't see you. So I'm, I'm also going to have Ms. Forbes come up. And so we're going to have to put everybody on the clock for two minutes, but we're going to start with Ms. Forbes, and then I want to hear from Ocean Bay, and then Green City Forest. Okay? All right. Thank you. And we need for you to state your name for the record. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Forbes. I'm also not. I'm also here as a resident, a tenant association president. But I do want everyone for City Council and NYCHA to know that I am the only representative from the United Nations representing the United States of America as the only tenant association president on that board. And. As Mark indicated, Councilman Mark indicated, we have been requesting NYCHA a seat at the table from July. Alika herself had attended that UN conference we held at Johnson Houses. Then we have another conference in October. We invited NYCHA again, and NYCHA has refused to sit with us at the table as residents to discuss employment section three and all over. Um, 
Next Generation has not been brought up, but Red has, and that's a very big concern that Mark has brought up, as well as the other gentleman who was sitting next to him, that we do not get to do the preparedness part of having the residents prepared before these jobs start, so let alone sit at the table. Civil service, this is the first time I've ever seen civil service and labor here at a meeting. I'm very glad to see you because I question why hasn't NYCHA trained residents to take the test that civil service put out. Um, employment is also a very big question in all areas of skilled trade, not just the painting, the electrical, the carpenter, um, various other areas that residents are not trained. Locations are nowhere near residents to me. It's a hardship. Coffee is provided, but I cannot even begin to tell you. The big numbers that I just heard come out of the, their mouths, talking about the MWBE, them giving them billions of dollars, we still don't sit at those tables. And then most of all, I'm very concerned about is the misappropriation of the federal funding that if these contractors are being given tax cuts or tax breaks, then why aren't we still sitting at those tables for negotiations? I have a contractor at my development now who refused to hire any residents because he was so concerned about the union. Oh, this is union so-and-so on electrical. No, no residents could be hired. So they're telling you a lie when they say that, no, the pre-start meeting starts with the tenant association and that residents are being hired. No, when the contractor comes to the development, he comes to the development with the union that the union says, no, 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 and you can't even get the job. I can go, I have about three more things you want to say something. But, um... The, section, the location, no posting, no posting of any of these elaborate programs that they're here testifying about today do I ever see. Are they mailed in a section where a leaker that each household, they have the household composition that they know the ages of who in the household, who's working, who's not working. So why isn't these elaborate programs mailed directly to those households and given a chance for those residents to come in? It's unbelievable but that they would say only 150 people go through a program and don't nobody graduate or complete them because they don't give people enough time to graduate or complete them because nobody don't know nothing about them. The Section 3 list I was very concerned about was the permanent employment that people were getting, not just that people did, did a contract and got let go in two or three months, let alone six months. So who is permanently still working under the Section 3 list, wherever they go from 2014 to 2018? Um, the apprenticeship is not working with these unions and NYCHA, and I'll tell you this why, because if you got to go through the whole medical science project of being there five years for the apprenticeship, we barely as residents get hired at all on those apprenticeship programs. So if they say they got two or three residents out of each skill trade, that's a plus, not even a plus, it's a disrespect that no residents are hired through any of the unions. Again, like I said, with the tax break that are given to these unions and most of all why did the mayor not make it appropriate like you keep talking about amazon coming in that rail yards when i saw the first part of the rail yards being built in 500 workers was down there i sure didn't hear nothing about no section three workers from harlem from period the whole city so there's no economic development you up on it you up on it i'm telling you that you up on this no economic development being provided why would i want to take a lower skill wage job when i can be afforded a correct prevailing wage job in order to work for any of these contractors. So NYCHA sat here with this elaborate story that they just told you, and they do not work with the residents. They do not work with the tenant association presidents, and we do not sit at the table and just um, see union contractors are not in compliance. NYCHA is not doing the skilled trade. The apprenticeship is not working. No training for civil service tests. No Section 3 list for the permanents. Um, the location of the REACH program is not good, no posting, 
the appropriation funding, the tax cuts are given, but we're not receiving no money. And nobody's being pre-trained for any of things. No next generation, no red, the rail yards, the airport also. And we've asked for a seat at the table since October 14, 2018 and October, July 14th and October 27th and NYCHA will not sit at the table. Social service is a very, very, very important thing. As the gentleman said, if you don't have child care, you don't have other, other things in place to assist these residents, GED or nothing, we are not getting social service now with tenants who have, and she can tell you that I called the office 10 times on tenants who have hoarding conditions. They telling me about Ace um, Protective Services for Adults don't have nothing to do with nothing. I need to mind my business, but I made the referral. So how are you going to tell me that I made the referral that these tenants are not in danger of harming the other tenants with the hoarding because my development is particularly combustible. So I can have a fire. She got all this stuff in her house, and all this stuff going to blow up the whole building. It's just unbelievable the things that night you get up here and tell y'all that's unbelievable is not the truth. Not the truth. Thank you. Thank you so much. What, what, what? You're from the Bronx? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. That's My name is Maria Forbes. I'm the tenant association president for Claremont Consolidated, which has 78 presidents, but I represent Clay Avenue. Are, are, are you in, in council member Gibson's district? I sure am. So we do a, and this is for anyone, we do a civil service one. No one. Okay. That is kind of a, it, with, along with DCAS, it's an introduction to public service. How do you work, go to work for the city? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what does it mean to take a, te uh, a competitive or non-competitive exam, jobs that don't require exams? We will come wherever in the city that you invite us. I'll talk to <coughs> Council Member Gibson, and, and we can do a forum in the district. Okay, I'll give you my card. Uh, I just wanted to ask council, are we else? as are we as residents able to form our own union? You know, I still think the mob really got something to control and the mayor and the everybody else. Can we still form our own unions? So if you're talking to a former union president, don't go there. Okay. And I think that is definitely integrity, but listen, this I'm a 501c3 yeah, incorporated. But, but a union is like everything else. It has to reflect the value in the people, right? So that's it. It's hard. Next. Hard. On the board. Hi, attention members and guests. My name is John Allen. I come to tell you and inform you of the WavePress RAD program. Before the RAD program development was run by NYCHA and was a bit rough, it was a lot of repairs that needed to be done. The building had no cameras in them. People were ruining the place. The RAD program began, they offered people that lived in the development jobs. I was one of those people. Before I started working, I knew very little about porter work. They gave me the opportunity, and now after being trained, I'm one of the best. I learned how to wax, buff, strip floors, pull compactors. It was one of the greatest opportunities that I had, that I was afforded. They also renovated all the apartments. They gave the apartment, they gave everyone paint jobs, replaced windows, light fixtures, remodeled bathrooms. Everything was brand new. They gave tenants stainless steel appliances. They remodeled lobbies. They replaced hallway floors. Not only that, they, employed, they installed flood walls, landscaping, planting new trees and flowers. I can go on and on about the program. I'm so happy to be a part. I'm so happy and honored to be a part of the Way Press RAD program, and I was, I'm happy I was afforded the opportunity. Now, one thing you was talking about, sir, about the, uh, the pay raise, I think that's why a lot of people that was from NYCHA, they left, because it was a, a big cut. They didn't want to take that, and it was private owned, so they was going to lose what they, what they uh, worked hard for. So that was one of the things. And then another thing that I didn't like is that we wasn't uh, afforded to uh, pick our union. They just put a union on us, and we wasn't afforded to pick it. We wanted 32BJ, and they just threw a, a union inside and said, this is your union, this is who you're going to go with. There was no vote. There was no agreement. Everybody that, that tried to get 32BJ, they got replaced. So you are represented by who now? I work for Wavecrest. The bargaining, who is the bargaining unit or the union representing you now? Um, there's just some union. They just do it through together. I don't even know. I'm sorry. 
Is that so? So we'll we'll we'll, we'll find that. Sixty-seven local sixty-seven. Sixty-seven of who? Who? Who's there? They're affiliated with who? Laborers. Uh, they just put it on us. That's what I'm saying. Allied. To my, okay, I, I'll, I'll find that out for sure. Um, okay. so, I'll come back with the okay. question. So. Good afternoon, my name is Mara Cerezo and I'm the Senior Program Officer for Green City Force. In addition to working with young adults from New York City's public housing for the past seven years, I'm also an individual whose family personally benefited from public and subsidized housing. And my father grew up in Red Hook houses. I'm here to share how GCF works with NYCHA to ensure that Section 3 hiring requirements translate into concrete economic opportunity for young NYCHA residents. Green City Force is a nonprofit organization that exclusively recruits NYCHA residents aged 18 to 24 from developments across the city. GCF exists to bridge the gap between the untapped potential of NYCHA's unemployed youth and the major investments in greening our city that are creating jobs accessible to people without college degrees. GCF aspires to catalyze a generation of young public housing residents to access new career opportunities and shape a sustainable New York City. We're grateful to the City Council for the generous funding you provide to support service training and workforce opportunities for young people in public housing. Through GCF Service Corps, young NYCHA residents serve as AmeriCorps members, earning money and working towards certifications and education scholarship while greening NYCHA communities. One of the barriers to young residents accessing jobs in the sustainability sector is that they lack a way to develop an interest and meet people working in these fields. GCF offers a point of entry. Our teams drive large-scale initiatives that reach thousands of residents building and maintaining urban farms that provide residents with organic produce at no cost, and promoting zero waste through composting and recycling. In the process, members build 21st century in-demand skills, and GCF provides support services and works with our graduates over time to ensure a next step into work, apprenticeship, school, or a combination. We continue to partner with graduates long-term to help ensure they can advance along a career path. The best illustration of why Section 3 is beneficial and why we value our partnership with NYCHA is through the stories of our graduates. Martin Bowron, a Brownsville resident, was recruited with the help of Reese, joined our core with no prior experience in energy efficiency. After graduating, he joined our social enterprise and contract with Amoresco. And seeing his work ethic, he was hired as a site supervisor. That contract ended. He came back as a crew leader at GCF. And the folks at Constellation saw his amazing work ethic out there and scooped him up. He's a site superintendent over there now. There's a lot more I have written here, but you got me on the clock, so thank you, Council. We have a copy of okay. it, and so I really do appreciate your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone? Okay. Hello? Okay. Um, my name is William and Gregory. And we too have a copy of you. Yeah. Uh -huh. My name is William Gregory. I'm a resident for Castle Hill Houses in the Bronx, and I also currently work for Green City Forest. Before I started working for Green City Forest, my dad had a stroke, and it, was, and it forced me to kick out of college. Um, there was a ton of bills I couldn't pay, and I also had very little work experience. After speaking with a recruiter, I joined GCF, and my life was never the same again. Um, I was a miracle member in GCF, and uh, I was a miracle member with GCF in their 10th cohort, where I discovered my passion for energy efficient and I worked work in low income communities. I was involved in GCF outreach campaign called Love Where You Live which focused on energy efficient upgrades for nature residents and informed them on different ways they could save energy through their, through their apartment. I also earned money in a metro card. I also earned a miracle education award that could help me go back to school whenever I'm ready. Uh, my time as a core member with GCF gave me the work experience, certification, and skills that helped me land a job with Association of Energy Affordability as a field tech. Um, I was installing LEDs, shower heads, and also faucet aerators inside people's home. Uh, I worked for um, AA for or, or, I worked for AA for over a year and a half, but I lost my job because I was chronically late all the time. Shortly after that, I obtained employment with an energy service company, which was not good fit for different reasons. After struggling to find a meaningful job, GCF helped me regain my foothold by offering me the chance to rejoin to join their social enterprise as a illuminator, uh, which worked on NYCHA EPC project for retrofitting public housing development around the city. This has allowed me to build a track record with my punctuality, punctuality, and professional skills. 
It provided me a way to support my father and me and keep moving up in the field. I never thought I would aim high as I am right now. Um, throughout the mentorship and the support from GCF, uh, I was promoted as a crew leader. Now it's my job to lead a team of new GCF alumni and show them the roles. I love able to educate the resident about energy, sustainability, and I believe the work I do makes a difference in their lives. My, co my career goal is to make every home in New York City energy efficient. Thank you for the chance. To, thank you for the chance. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And I'm proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> That's it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Wait, we have one more. Buenas tardes, damas y caballeros. Mi nombre es Ambrosio Paulino. Estoy aquí para decirle que cuando yo me mudé a Ocean Bay Housing, a Ocean Bay Housing, Para mí era una pesadilla porque siempre se llamaban pelea callejera, muchos tiroteos, pero gracias a Dios, dice que nada más tenemos dos minutos, gracias a Dios que Welcre llegó, ahora estamos muy contentos, la comunidad completa, porque todo es, todo es más limpio, más tranquilidad, más paz. Eh, me siento muy orgulloso de estar viviendo allá ahora. Antes vivía con mucho susto porque trabajaba de noche, se llamaba mucha balacera, yo caminando, camino a la escuela, a los muchachos, a la iglesia. Eh, presente los muchachos conmigo ahí nos hallaba yo como tirarlo al piso pero estoy muy contento ahora mismo si nada más un dos minutos es todo por ahora well, so I'll be um, providing a summary of what he said um, he said he's here to um, his name is Ambrosio Paulino and he moved to Ocean Bay when he moved to Ocean Bay it was very difficult there was a lot of violence and there was a lot of um, just a very difficult neighborhood. And thank God, ever since Ocean Bay came into the picture, everything is better. It's clean. He used to walk the streets with fear, traveling with his children to school. And now uh, things are so much better. And he's relieved that. Sí, me siento muy feliz ahora. He's very happy now. Sí, la familia también. And the family as well. Ya creció. Sí. Que ya creció. Que ya creció. Está grande mi familia ya. Oh, that the children have been growing and they've grown up and everyone is happy. Estamos toditos contentos ahora, pero antes era mucho susto. And before it was very difficult and scary. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. The, the union that represents Ocean Bay now is 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 Ocean. What what is the affiliation between Wavecrest and Ocean Bay? Is there one? I think Wavecrest manages the moment. I'm David Priston. I'm executive vice president for external affairs at NYCHA. Now we got to do this, Dave. Uh, <laughs> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Um, so your question is, what's the relationship between Wavecrest and um, Ocean Bay? So Ocean Bay is the, there's a, there's a development team that is made up of MDG um, and Wavecrest. MDG is the construction, is the construction side that has been doing the, the re, um, renovations of the building. Um, the rehabilitation of the building, and Wavecrest is the property management team. Wavecrest is a property management company uh, that manages m m many buildings across the city, um, and they are the property management company now at Ocean Bay. Is the uh, the same Wavecrest that manages the uh, residential uh, beach channel kind of? I'm not. I'm the Rockaways there. That, that's their primary. Uh, uh, the, the the workers here say yes. I I yeah, I, that, I, yeah, I can't that, speak to that. That would be they the, say, the, yeah, the primary confirm. facility, their largest facility there. Um, so my question is, to I don't know if you can answer. Um, are, are, are they? Does does the workers at the Wavecrest facilities belong to the same union? Wave Crest on Beach Channel. On Beach Channel, yeah, yeah, we on the same, yeah, the same. Yeah. Okay. The same Ocean Bay, yeah. yeah. Ocean Bay. No, no, I'm talking about Wave Crest. Oh, you said Wave Crest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah,
Just have to that's, come that's, to yeah. the. Oh, me? No, 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 no. That's different. That's different. That's different. Come, come to the table. <laughs> It's just, it's just, it's just very, I'm, I'm trying to ascertain whether or not that was a union that was already in place with the management company when they took over. You took my for, for Ocean Bay. Yeah. Did they, did they, did they, do those, do the workers at Wavecrest belong to the same union? To your knowledge? No, nah, no, 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 no. You got a different. They, they union is different from ours. You know who they're represented by? It's probably thirty-two. I'll find it. Okay, right. thank you. I know we got 670 there. I think it's 32. Okay, I'll let you know. But you said 670 or 60? That's our union, 670. 670. 670. Which is, which, is, which is a local of the Service Employees International Union, an SEIU, six, I guess 670. I was, I was trying yeah. to figure out the exact local Service, it was. Yeah, yeah. I just said something else before, that's why. So, um, a lot of the testimony from the residents of, of Ocean Bay talked about the conditions and including the social conditions and, and so forth, which I don't, while wow, um, the, the, the uh, transformation and the transition um, is, is, has certainly enhanced the, the uh, residents, uh, the physical and, uh, conditions and, and through the capital projects, but but I know a little bit about Far Rock myself, and, and I know that that happens to be one of the uh, the um, crisis management cri uh, uh, caption areas and, and so forth. So there's a lot going on that contributes to that. And, and one of the things I want to kind of just, while we have you there, was um, do you know how much of capital investment Involved here at Ocean Bay specifically, is FEMA. We're, well, we have to get back to you on the breakdown of the invest. So the investment at Ocean Bay, breaking down how much was FEMA and how much was through the RAD transaction. Right. We can. We can. We don't. We didn't come with that information, but we can provide that to now, you. Now they talked about the, the protective walls and other things. It, 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 would that be something that would be within? Uh, kind of within the purview of, of nature, or was that a kind of a FEMA mandate uh, based on what we've seen that they have to create uh, based on, uh, uh, you know, the Army Corps or whatever? Because I, I know the city and that we've here in the council created certain mandates in, in certain low-lined areas. Um, so th th that would certainly be FEMA money as well, right? The I mean, we'd have to get to the exact details, but yes, the FEMA funding for many developments, including Ocean Bay, included resiliency and and you know and and um, stormproofing and waterproofing of the of the buildings and the mechanical equipment. So the substantial capital investment that that we've seen in nitro developments, would it be safe to say that a significant portion of that are in areas that were impacted by Hurricane Sandy? So, sorry, can you repeat the question again? So when, when Councilmember Traeger talked about the work that were being done in his area, in his community, and, and, and talking specifically about Far Rockaway, those are obviously two communities that were impacted by Hurricane Sandy. Obviously, we're, we're looking at federal dollars and FEMA dollars involved in there. Um, is it safe to say that a significant amount of the capital work that we're seeing done in the NYCHA, NYCHA uh, developments are by virtue of the results of Hurricane Sandy and, and, and similar funding? I mean, I think it's definitely fair to say substantial. I, I think we'd have to get back to you on the exact percentages. I think the, the Sandy program is, I think it's a $3 billion program or... Yeah, I mean that, that's that's what was that was what was was provided in the in the uh, Sandy grants that are a combination of FEMA, um, CDBG money, and a, and a few other funding sort federal sources. Um, but um, so I mean, it's not. I would say that it's you know it's a significant, but we we do have substantial grants from um, our our you know annual federal ca capital grant, our city ca uh, capital mm -hmm. grants, and our state capital grants are. Um, also make up the other pieces of our capital work. Okay. Yeah, because while three billion sounds like a lot of money, in the world of construction in New York City, is a drop in the bucket. So yeah, thank you. I appreciate. It.
I'm like, I'm, I was looking at the press release from RAD last year. So we have our final two um, testimonies will come from Jason Hewitt and Annie Garniva. Annie Garniva with the New York City Employment and Training Coalition and Jason Hewitt with Constellation, can't read what that says, Incorporated. So please state your name and your organization. Good afternoon, my name is Jason Hewitt. I'm a senior project manager for uh, Constellation. In my position, I am responsible for managing construction activities associated with the Brooklyn Queens Demand Management, BQDM, energy performance contract, uh, which was awarded to uh, Constellation in 2017 by the New York City Housing Authority. I have an integral involvement in the uh, initial development and ongoing management of Constellation Section 3 program in collaboration with NYCHA's Office of Resident Economic Empowerment and Sustainability Reese. Working together, we have implemented and monitored our Section 3 uh, We do initiative. have your testimony in front of us, and so if you can just summarize some quick points within the time frame, that'll be helpful. Thank you. Great. So I've worked with uh, uh, Reese to develop our, our Section 3 plan. Uh, we have two projects, one the Sandy uh, A project um, and also the BQDM EPC. Together both projects uh, on the BQDM 23 developments, Sandy 32, um, uh, we were awarded both contracts uh, for both Sandy and BQDM in 2017 and we are currently in the second year of construction. Uh, we have committed to NYCHA uh, to employ over 92 new hires for this project. In our second year, we are just about uh, 70, 76 uh, new hires for our project. Uh, most of it has been through our collaborative uh, uh, partnership or uh, engagement with Green City Force, uh, which is a nonprofit organization, as well as Association for Biz uh, for Energy and Associ uh, Energy and Affordability. Um, we've also, uh, on the onset of the project, teamed up with uh, Reese uh, to. Um, provide the funding associated with uh, the aptitude test uh, that will be needed for the section uh, the section three um, local three entry exam we had 12 residents signed up for that program um, out of that 12 resident nine were successful on the aptitude test and are now currently working um, uh, as apprentices uh, through the local three uh, we continue our engagement uh, with Reese and also with our local community entities. Uh, Constellation believe uh, that we are, if we are going to be successful, we must uh, invest back in the communities which we live and work. And our, we will continue to make strides as we uh, fulfill our Section 3 requirements and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Annie Garniva. I'm the Communications Director at the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. Uh, the coalition is an organization of about 150 members who are mostly workforce development service providers like Green City Force, for example. Um, so, of course, you have my testimony, and we, rather than specifically talking about the details that you've been talking about Section 3, we just want to highlight some things that are really important for you to consider uh, in broad strokes. So one, Section 3 is really the only place where um, both economic development and hiring requirements come together, and we find that the 30% is a really strong benchmark that doesn't really exist in other government programming. So wherever um, this can be strengthened and best practices can be used to um, further economic development projects, such as the Amazon project, um, and wherever you as council can emphasize those things is really helpful. Two, similarly to the some of the um, 
items that Council Member Traeger brought up. It's not just about requirements. Uh, any mandated statement like that doesn't really go anywhere, as we've seen, unless there's actual mechanisms that can help people thrive in those situations. So uh, we, as a workforce development community, really emphasize the need for proper training uh, and not just three-month training or even five-year trainings that seem to not necessarily be embedded in business practices, um, but we, we need um, both the mayor and the city council to use its enforcement mechanism and place uh, really invest in these communities by emphasizing that workforce development is a priority and to get people out of poverty and e into actual career pathways. So one example that we'll point to is the need for bridge programs. Um, some of the exact issues that council member Trigger brought up would be in part um, improved if bridge programs, which are really meant to help people who either don't have uh, some variety of skills, whether that's numeracy or literacy problems, as well as various barriers to employment, whether it be justice involvement, um, lack of English skills, whatever it may be, bridge programs are meant to tackle those issues so that someone can actually take advantage of the really high level training programs like Green City Force. Those have high bar requirements. IT, the IT tech jobs that are going to be created by Amazon have very high requirements that most individuals, whether they be in public housing or not, won't be able to attend. Um, so currently, those programs have been funded at eight million. The mayor promised to fund them at 60, and we're a wide far gap off. Um, and then equally, like you said, retention, meaning creating holistic programs that uh, help people with childcare, help people with transportation issues, are also should not fall off and should be considered as part of workforce development. Uh, the rest, you have our testimony and you have our policy priorities that really go into detail about funding levels and what kinds of things need to be taken into account to make these programs strong. Thank you. So yeah, we're, we're gonna send you something in our follow-up as well um, to, to both of you. So I do have one question for each and, and um, first, uh, when we, as we talk about developing uh, programs, workforce development, how, how, how do you identify uh, citywide, um, obviously we're talking about NYCHA, but within NYCHA and then citywide, specific needs for, for training um, in advance of these capital projects or emerging industries that are coming up throughout, like we're talking about NYCHA, we're talking about, in, in, you know, in, uh, uh, what's going on in the Rockaways and surrounding um, transportation around the airport areas and the emerging hospitality industry and all those things like that. Are we specifically speaking to um, those needs within those industries? Are we training folks for those needs within those specific industries? Or are we actually going into communities having conversations about um, what those needs are? Is the we question? Who's the we in the circumstance? We, the city, um, yeah. we the coalition. We the coalition. Sure. So we, as a coalition, uh, rely in a lot uh, on our workforce development members. So those are the experts in the field. So people like Mara, who are directly interacting with employers and asking them questions about what their specific needs are within that particular sector. There's so. The best answer is there's multiple ways of doing this, and they should all be implemented at the same time. The cities, in part, um, Career Pathways program created broader industry partnerships, which are meant to be kind of the intermediary for business and workforce development. Um, however, there are some questions around whether there are strong enough communication enforcements to actually get that information in the hands of workforce development providers. Um, there's also you know, at the end of the day, f about 50% of work exists, is, is shifting, and so all of these programs need to shift with it. And a lot of those things fall in the soft skills category, which are actually fundamental and so, skills. So I'm simply saying is that who's in the, the, you said you talked about people who are on the ground. Who's on the ground identifying what these emerging, the, look, I will tell you that, you know, um, I represent a community that's close by Kennedy Airport, right? There's a logistic uh, need there 
right? But I've not heard anybody talking about the training anyone for the logistics industry or the the 20 hotels that are coming up in the area in the hospitality and very specifically about that. Then then because sometimes we're either reinventing the wheel or we're we're, we're we're thinking too hard about what's happening and 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 not being on the ground. And, and kind of understanding what's coming to the communities and what those needs of what those industries are going to be in the next five years and so forth. And, and just, you know, so I, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page and being that there is a coalition that you're working with and it's not incumbent upon one group that I'm sure that someone in, in, your, in your general meetings that you're having these conversations and that hopefully that you can meet with the people on the ground within those communities and kind of uh, be able to uh, work these things out. Because I, I will tell you that, you know, that's just off the top of my head, but, you know, there are four or five different things that I know that are really substantial as we go through the city. Every member can tell you a little something about their district that has a potential economic impact that we haven't tapped into yet. Right. The connection to what employers need on the ground is imperative and for all players involved. And uh, we as a coalition have a way of, you know, a, a process through which we interact with employers, which is both the employer partners of our members and individual partnerships that we make. But also it is a part of the problem of why the system is so un disconnected is that that kind of work, the capacity to build business partnerships for the sake of information is underfunded. Thank you. Says. And, and, and uh, Mr. Hewitt, um, yes. is your shop a union shop? No. We are... Uh, so what's your affiliation <laughs> with Local 3? We, we, we're actually a, a, a power company, a competitive retail power and gas company. Um, part of our arm is Constellation Energy that offers uh, energy um, efficiency services, uh, teaches uh, clients how to save energy, reduce their carbon footprint. Um, I will say that when we uh, first started this project, um, we met with uh, Nitro Reese, and one of the re one of the things that helped us to uh, get the program uh, that we we, uh, we we laid the groundwork for was something that Reese had going already. Uh, they were already having trainings that uh, will prepare young folks for the aptitude test. And we saw an opportunity there where we could come in, uh, where a resident could not uh, afford to travel back and forth or lunches and just the overall curriculum, um, we were able to step in and, 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 and be able to, to fund part of that. And I think if more businesses know that they can uh, contribute and make an investment um, in, in those areas, it will definitely help. Um, I will say that we invested in the training for these young folks, knowing that um, there was no strings attached, right? They were able to move on to other projects. Immediately when those uh, nine folks passed their aptitude test, they were picked up by different agencies to work. So they're not really working on our, our specific project, even though we would have loved to have them. But I think we provide a sustainable path forward that it's not just tied to one project, but it's something that, that can go on um, even when this project ends. And, and where, where, where is your company um, headquarters? Our headquarters uh, is in Baltimore. Is it MWBE? No. Um, two questions for Constellation. Yes, um, who are you working I know you mentioned that you are working with Reese and other community participants. Um, can you name some of the like local community um, organizations that you work with for both Sandy and for the BQDM? Um, we're working with Green City Forest, of course, is one of our mm -hmm. prime contributors, as well as the Association for uh, um, Energy and Affordability, AEA. Okay. And um, how often do you meet with NYCHA about your progress or just like the work that you're doing on the ground? We, we have had several meetings just to gear our um, 
our employment to based on the scopes of work that are being developed um, so that we know what's coming and can give NYCHA an heads up or Reese an heads up on what are the different positions that are coming available. That's part of our Section 3 plan when we're moving forward. And my last question, um, do you also meet with the resident association leaders? Yes, we have had... Uh, um, through all the developments that we have progressed through, uh, BQDM has 23 developments throughout uh, our portfolio. Uh, Sandy A has 18. All of those encompasses a startup meeting where the resident association leader was invited. Some of, of them attended, some did not. Um, and for those that we, we were able to speak to the resident, we spoke directly to the resident at the TA meetings to inform them of the uh, oncoming project. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank and, you. And um, thank you, everyone, for the um, four, has it been four hours? Four hour um, hearing today. So that will conclude our um, Committee on Public Housing and Committee on Civil Service and Labor Oversight Joint Hearing on Section 3 Hiring Requirements. I do not see any um, testimony, any other submitted testimony. For the record, no. Any other written testimony. I don't see any in front of me. So that concludes this hearing. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Colleen. Well, you had, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, 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 you always have these long. We need, to, we, need to, we need to break for lunch next time. So bring a little, a drink card, a drink card and four. Would you like a cocktail?